I guess, last workshop of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, I, I guess we'd just call it the Christmas workshop. We have a number of items this morning, so we'll get going here pretty quickly. Under the first item, which is utilities, we'll talk about North County Reclaimed Water Master Plan, advanced metering infrastructure and private sewer lateral policies. And then we're going to talk about code enforcement process. Number three will be the American Rescue Plan Act, known as ARPA. Um, number four will be the redistricting update. Uh, it'll be our second workshop on that item. And then we'll make a decision or final decisions at our commission meeting on December 7th about the redistricting. And then the, the fifth item on the agenda is term limits. And then we'll get into the agenda briefing. And uh, so we've got a full schedule and turn it over to you, Barry, to get us started for number one, utilities. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Megan is on her way up. We got three items to give you kind of an update on and get your feedback regarding um, the utilities department and, and several activities she has going. So I'll just turn it over to Megan. Good morning, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Megan Ross, utilities director for Pinellas County. I think we're waiting for the presentation to get pulled up. Uh, but today we have two presentations for you from utilities. The first one will be on the implementation of the North County Reclaimed Water Master Plan. And the second one will be on the private sewer lateral policy options. For our first presentation today on the North County Reclaimed Water System Master Plan, we will be reviewing the status of implementation of the recommendations uh, that were made. One of the recommendations ties directly to the Advanced Metering Infrastructure Project, which will be coming to the board for approval in the next few months. Thus, we will be expanding on the details of this project in greater depth as part of today's presentation. Our goal is to answer any questions you may have on the progress and path forward for this project. So to first provide some background, the North County Reclaim Water Master Plan was completed in December of 2018 and the purpose of the master plan was to enhance reclaimed water availability for North County customers. The plan's objectives were to evaluate current and future demands on the system and to identify short-term and long-term improvements to meet those demands. The plan and recommendations were presented to the board in April of 2019. So the master plan recommendations included a three-phased approach to meeting the objectives previously mentioned. <clears throat> Phase one includes implementing operational improvements to enhance existing supply capabilities, such as modifying existing distribution pumps, as well as piping modifications to allow for enhanced distribution and pressures throughout the system. Phase two includes demand management through advanced metering infrastructure, also known as AMI, Phase two also includes implementing adopted rates and installation of advanced meters that will result in better management of supply, demand, and usage. Later during the presentation, I will cover in more detail the project and its deliverables. And phase three includes identification of supplemental supply and storage, including the implementation of aquifer storage recovery, utilizing excess water from Lake Tarpon. Uh, just before you go on, I. A little oversight on my part, um, just want to make sure that folks know that uh, Commissioner Seal will be participating this morning virtually. Um, um, I'm, 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 not, I'm so confused right now about whether we have to approve anything uh, at, for a workshop, and I, I'm just going to, I don't think we do for a workshop, I think we do for, but in any event, she's participating and she will be uh, weighing in. And I did hear from Commissioner Peters, who said she was going to try to be here, but if she did, it would be late. So anyway, sorry about that, Megan. Sure. Go ahead. So just getting into some more detail on the status of these phases, phase one specifically includes upgrades to our reclaimed water distribution pumps and piping. The design phase for this project has been initiated with the Ardura Group as the selected consultant. The construction phase is estimated to start in fiscal year 23 and to be completed in fiscal year 24. Phase two includes the advanced metering infrastructure project that is currently in final negotiations with the highest ranking firm. The recommendation of award is expected to be presented to the board in early 2022. Pending board approval, the construction phase for this project is estimated to start shortly thereafter 
and the project is expected to be completed by the end of 2025. Uh, phase three includes increasing reclaimed water supply through a managed aquifer storage and recovery system with Lake Tarpon as a water source. Various implementation steps have already been taken to move forward with this project. First, a preliminary engineering report was initiated to assess feasibility and cost of the project. Jones Edmonds was the selected consultant to develop this engineering report. So the report was completed, and in addition, uh, the design of the wells was also completed in September of 2019. A permit application was then submitted to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in March of 2020. Since then, staff have been working with FDEP to provide additional requested information regarding the project. So a decision regarding the permit application is expected from FDEP next year, in 2022, uh, additionally, two firms have been competitively selected for contractual professional hydrogeologic services to assist during the construction inspection. So the board approved that contract earlier this year in August. Once permits are approved, the next step is to initiate a bid for construction of this supply and storage system. Megan, um, the first two items that you talked about, phase one and two, <clears throat> operational improvements um, and then the metering throughout the system so we can monitor for leaks and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Do those two things alone give us hope that there'll be some additional capacity found in, in, in the system um, without, so, I mean, not the big capacity, but. Right, so the metering infrastructure in particular will help to manage demands. And so right now, because we don't necessarily have any idea of how much is being utilized by customers throughout the system. It's hard to say exactly how much that will reduce demand, but other utility case studies have shown up to 40% reduction. Mm. Even still, in the master plan report, it was determined that we would still need a supplemental supply even with a reduction of demand currently. So uh, that's why we are still moving forward with the uh, aquifer storage and recovery. So, so yeah. it used to be four houses that you needed to supply one home with reclaimed, kind of the numbers that I used to hear. Yeah. Does that, I mean, is, is that kind of thing still there? Do we, with the additional supply and storage, are there, are, will there be other opportunities to add people on uh, to the system or are we tapped out right now as far as? I would say we're tapped out. For the current. Yes, um, because keep in mind there are still some customers that have availability, the service connection is there, but they are not utilizing it yet. So you assume So in other that, words, yeah. you want to be able to have that supply available for those customers. Um, so I, I doubt that there would be any <clears throat> ability to expand the system further. Uh, in, until yeah. we get the supply storage thing worked out, or even then? I think even then, okay. um, you know, I think it's, it's difficult now with, this, with uh, the county being built out you know, typically with a lot of these reclaimed water systems, you really want to do it upon development. Uh, it's less costly that way to go back into a current development and, you know, rip out all the roads and install reclaimed water. It's it's a, it's a lot more costly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not yeah. encouraging people now to hook up that can, right? Right. People yeah. that have availability can go ahead and hook up and they start can. getting that yeah. okay. usage going. But okay. Uh, okay. yeah, new connections. Okay. Likely. Thank you. Uh, uh, Karen, uh, Commissioner Seal, did you have a question? I'm happy to wait until the end of Megan's presentation, but I just did want to at least alert you. I did have questions. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So at this point, I'll be expanding on phase two, which is demand management through the implementation of advanced metering infrastructure. Before proceeding, I would like to point out that while AMI will address the reclaimed water system master plan recommendations, this project will also be implemented throughout our drinking water system. So with that in mind, I will be highlighting the value and benefits to our customers for both the reclaimed water system and the drinking water system. So what is AMI and how does it work? This graphic provides a high level depiction of how an AMI system functions. Once the customer receives a newly installed AMI meter, the water usage data is then relayed from the water meter, which is located at or near the customer's property, through a cellular network that transmits the data to a software system. 
This software system is integrated with the Pinellas County Utilities customer information system, which is utilized for billing. Simultaneously, the same software system also connects back to a customer interface portal where the customer has access to their own water usage data. This interface technology is what sets apart AMI from other metering options. So by providing this interface, it allows customers to be in control of their own water usage and can help mitigate water leaks and conserve water. Additionally, this can provide more convenient customer service options for billing increase. So going back to the benefits of having AMI for our reclaimed water system customers, the first benefit I will highlight is the ability to implement a usage-based rate structure as opposed to what we have currently, which is an unmetered flat rate for residential reclaimed water customers. So I just want to highlight again and emphasize, currently our residential reclaimed water customers are not metered, which means we have no mechanism to understand the demands being placed throughout our service area. Additionally, we have no customer incentive to reduce excessive reclaimed water usage. Yeah, okay, hold on, Commissioner Flowers. I know, um, and I don't want to forget this, that's why I'm asking now. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is an affirmative move because oftentimes persons who have their watering system on a timer, even when it's raining, mm -hmm. the reclaimed water system will engage, and so you see uh, their lawns being watered while it's pouring down raining, so I think that's really good. Um, I guess my question is, um, and the concern, and this happened in St. Pete, a lot of people signed up for reclaimed water for that purpose because mm -hmm. it wasn't metered. Right. And now we're going, potentially going to a metered process, which I support. I, I think that's a really good idea. And so at some point during your presentation, if you don't already have it, if we could talk about um, the, the educational component piece to explain to those people why now their services are being changed because um, I don't I wasn't here when this was all implemented so in some instances neighbors in, in St. Pete I don't know how you all how the county does it but you had to pay to have those reclaimed water lines brought to your home um, right. and so you really wanted to do it as an entire block and that helped mm -hmm. reduce the cost of the individual homeowners and so I think that may be somewhat of a concern because persons have made that investment, if that's how this happened. They made that investment, and so now they're having to pay additionally. So just if you would maybe talk about that later. Yeah, and I, we, we touch a little bit on the fact that there will be a customer education and outreach as part of the project. We don't go into depth today about what that looks like. That is still under development. But we absolutely recognize that this transition is, is going to take um, a significant amount of education and outreach as far as understanding why we're doing this and, and the benefits of it. Um, so that'll certainly be a component going forward. Yeah, it's a big change. Commissioner Justice have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we, we don't meet her now, so we don't know if Mr. Jones uses 1,000 gallons and Mrs. Smith uses one gallon? Right. Okay, wow. Uh, the only way that we, you know, we have... Um, watering restrictions in place. We have an ordinance that has watering restrictions for reclaimed water. So our only mechanism is we have water conservation officers that go out in the middle of the night during off watering hours and just visually scan um, for people that are irrigating. Not, not, not a good system. Which, <laughs> so uh, it just gives us absolutely no way to see our people over watering or under, you know, I mean, we just don't know what's going on. Sounds, sounds a little creepy. Having people out in the middle of the night, but <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think, yeah, and again, uh, the, uh, the question was, and this the system will allow uh, tiering rates as well if we want to go that rate route. I mean, there are times in the year when the availability of the product mm -hmm. is so low. <laughs> That and I know, you know we ha have ways to encourage people to stay at the number of gallons that they really need, as opposed to running it. I think the metering will help, but also I think we need to look at during those off months where the, the rain falls low and supply gets low and mm -hmm. all of that. That we look at a tiered system that you can use this much at the right rate, and then just something to think about because yeah. it really encourages the right amount of usage and not, you know wasteful usage but again that comes to sure uh, we talked about a little bit education and 
and that kind of thing because it doesn't take that much every week to keep your grass going. No, so. it really doesn't, and that's a good point. AMI will allow us to do all those things. It will kind of open this door to allow us to look at those options. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead, Megan. Okay. So now I'd like to move on to our drinking water system. I'll discuss the current meter reading process for our drinking water system. So the drinking water system is currently metered. However, that system that we have in place for obtaining the water usage data is performed manually. Every day, staff are walking to individual homes to physically read each analog meter. This process is labor intensive. It's somewhat antiquated and inefficient at capturing accurate water usage and billing information. For example, the analog meters are often stuck and broken due to older age, and the dials are difficult to read, which can result in erroneous usage data. It takes over two months to read all the meters, which results in more lag time between usage and when a customer actually receives the bill. Currently, most of the water meters are at the end of useful life and will need to be replaced over the next several years, even without this project. And lastly, customers are unable to proactively identify potential water leaks within their homes. So there are numerous benefits with implementing an AMI system. In addition to some of the customer benefits already discussed, this new infrastructure will provide enhanced customer service by allowing them real-time access to their water usage account and will also enable monthly billing as opposed to the bi-monthly billing currently in place along with the fact that the billing will be more accurate. This will also allow customers to access and potentially address billing discrepancies 24-7 through the portal. Additionally, implementing AMI will save millions of dollars and will result in a favorable return on investment. So expanding further on cost savings, proceeding with AMI implementation will result in a cost savings of $17 million over a 20-year period. Additionally, there will be a nine-year return on investment for the capital project costs. This chart depicts a net present value analysis that was conducted to compare the capital and operating and maintenance costs associated with implementing AMI as compared to not implementing AMI, just currently doing what we're doing now. The overall total costs, including capital and operating costs for implementing AMI are much lower than not implementing AMI. So this estimate includes uh, the network and software service fees as well associated with AMI. I'm, a, I'm assuming that capital under the non-AMI means replacing the meters we have that are really in bad shape. Yes, oh. just continuing to replace as they're stuck and broken and right. doing what okay. we need to do. Okay. So you're still going to have that fixed cost if you don't go with AMI. You're still going to have to replace these meters Right, as they break, because yeah. they're breaking all the time. So we're having to replace them just, you know, as they fail. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this slide shows the trend of utilities around Florida that are implementing or have implemented AMI. Many utilities throughout the state, including some within the Tampa Bay region, have realized the benefits of the technology that it can have for their system and their customers. So we see it's, it's, a, uh, it's a trend that's occurring frequently throughout the state. Uh, the project timeline for AMI implementation includes five phases. The project is expected to be completed near the end of 2025. The phase approach allows efficient planning, implementation, and delivery of the project. This project will also include a public outreach effort to educate customers from the start of the project, and the contractor will also provide a direct customer contact line to answer any questions. These five phases represent a turnkey approach for meter, box, and lid installation and upgrades for both water and reclaimed water systems, along with implementation and integration of network software and ongoing service and support. So the total budgeted amount for the project is $72.3 million. The county did receive a minor amount of co-funding from Swift Mud in the amount of just over $139,000. And that's specifically for the WaterSmart software. That's that customer interface portal we talked about, which promotes more water conservation. The drinking water portion of the project, shown in blue, accounts for about 64% of the total project cost, or $46.3 million. Um, and that's just for equipment and installation combined. And then the reclaimed water portion amounts to about 16%, or $11.5 million 
shown in purple. So that's also including both equipment and installation added together. Um, and shown in yellow is the total amount for the annual fees over a total of 10 years. So that's $10.5 million. Megan, a quick, quick question. And the meters that you're talking about, um, like it, if you brought a meter to my house, uh, you have a meter for water and a meter for reclaim, or would you use the same metering? I mean, I don't know how that, usually per line is a meter. But Yeah, there will be two separate meters. So okay. if you are a drinking water and reclaimed water customer, you we will, will be replacing your box and meter for the water system and then we'll be installing a new box and meter for the reclaim water yeah. line because yeah. there currently isn't one there. But the, the other thing to add is if, you, if they've replaced the, um, the meter recently, you can add just the component to make it um, an AMI so you don't have to Correct. replace the entire thing so, so if it's a newer technology. Correct. So we've replaced about, due to the, the meters out, the analog meters, as they get stuck and broken, we have gone ahead and replaced them with a more upgraded electronic meter instead of just replacing in kind. And doing that has allowed us to integrate it pretty well with this project because now all we have to do is just add a cellular transmitter to those meters. We don't have to go back and replace them again. So this cost involves, includes both the meters. Yes. The water, and we're going to do them at the same time. I'm we're going to do it at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So to ensure that the most economical project delivery method was selected, four alternatives were evaluated using a 20-year net present value analysis. The first option on the left of the chart is the option we are recommending today and represents the lowest cost and maximum value to our customers through a rapid turnkey implementation. The, sec the second option we evaluated was to implement AMI in-house, utilizing existing staff and additional temporary staff. I would like to note this option not only represents a higher cost, but also a longer implementation time frame. Additionally, we may not be able to obtain the necessary uh, resources in-house for the network and software integration. The third option is implementing just the advanced meter reading, so the, the electronic meters only, it's known as AMR, uh, using a contractor for the installation of all the meters, but not implementing the AMI network and software. So I want to point out that the AMR type system would still require staff to be deployed to sites to obtain meter readings in the field. That would be a drive-by collection. And there would be no customer interface portal. Um, finally, the fourth option is implementing AMR using utility staff for the installation of the meters just similar to what we're doing now, uh, this option, uh, if we continue on this route, would result in significantly longer time frame, which would impact our ability to obtain really any return on investment due to the time frame it would take exceeding the actual life cycle of the meters. So our analysis concluded that outsourcing the implementation of AMI is the most economical option in addition to the benefits that AMI will bring to our customers. Uh, Megan, uh, back of that page where you had the circle and all the benefits, I guess, AMI mm -hmm. benefits for drinking water, um, under AMR, uh, although the cost difference is not, the, the, the net present value difference is not that significant, do a lot of these benefits still, per, or they're still okay, right? They're still part of the benefits under AMR as well, some of them. Some of them, I would say that, you know, reduced carbon footprint is probably not one of them. You still need vehicles driving around right. constantly to get the uh, information. You do not have notification of leaks. Like, for example, if, you're, if uh, your potential uh, leak inside your home, yeah, AMI deep. will give you an instant push notification. Yeah, I've got a number of calls like that. <clears> oh, yeah. You've got, you, you, I think you have a leak. <laughs> It turned out to be on theirs, but, you know, it was a problem. It, it did, right. So it's, it, it is helpful. <laughs> yes. And uh, also excessive use. I mean, there's people that go on vacation. They go on a cruise. All of a sudden, they come back. They have a $700 water bill. They have no idea why. And we don't know either. We're, you know, we don't know what happened. We, we have no way to, to uh, understand that. Some people buy a new home. They leave. They don't, you know, program their sprinklers and not, they don't even realize they're at work all day. Their sprinklers are running all day. They get a huge water bill. So this will push that, hey, you might want to look at this. You have high water usage. And they can fix it before they get the bill. You know, they can fix the problem. So that's, it's really a, a huge benefit. In addition to just the utility side benefit, 
which is now we have real-time information. We can potentially use the system to identify leaks in our system and identify yeah. just other issues that are going on. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank so, you. Okay. So that, that pretty much wrapped up my presentation. I'd be happy to, happy to answer any questions at this time. Commissioner Seal. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, Megan, um, when you go in to replace the meters, have you also accounted for costs for broken connections or pipes that have to be fixed or replaced or leaking or whatever? Is that in this cost or is that going to be an additional cost? For the individual service connections? It, it, yeah. it really depends if, if customers get a leak and it's on their side, their property side of the meter, that would be the responsibility of the customer. Um, if the leak is found to be on our side, that would be our responsibility. But yeah, really, anytime we know of a leak, we fix it. I mean, we, we are out correcting leaks all the time. We get calls about it. Um, you know, we go out and correct those leaks. Well, it's just kind of like the lateral sewer issue. Are you thinking that you're going to find lots of leaks as you replace these meters? So, you know, it's a little bit different only because the, a water system is pressurized as opposed to the sewer laterals are gravity. So um, because the water system is pressurized, usually when there's a leak, it's pretty apparent, you know, water will start coming out of the ground. Um, unless it's mm -hmm. just a minor leak. But yeah, if we're digging up things and we're seeing that there's a potential leak, we, we can address it. Yeah, if it's on our side. Okay. Um, the, um, using the cellular data system to be able to make AMI work, are there any alternatives such as you know, we've been installing fiber optics. We've been looking at different communication systems. Is there any way we could create our own system so that we don't have to pay another vendor? Yeah, I mean, at some point, if the county in the future builds out a pretty extensive fiber system, it could be utilized. Um, fiber is typically required when we have, you know, uh, heavy data communication needs, like ambulance, 911, traffic, those are like heavy, um, what are called, data packets, if you will. Meters, we're really only transmitting a small quantity of information every day. We're just getting a reading, and we can set it, you know, once an hour, <coughs> once a day. It's not a huge data set. Uh, so cellular really is the most economical at this point in time. If the county were to build out a fiber network for other purposes, you know, for public service, we could just kind of tag onto that. It wouldn't be a huge, um, it wouldn't take up a lot of volume of that communication. But I certainly wouldn't opt to just build a whole fiber network out just for AMI because it would be a huge capital expense just to do for this project. But it is a, it is a possibility. But, but we've already been building that fiber optic system for, um, for the traffic signal system. So it might be worth having a discussion um, to see if we could piggyback on any of that. Just a thought. Sure, we can look um, into that. The, um, so $72 million um, in cost, what are the revenues over the same period of time? If you were to do like a profit and loss statement, how would, what would that look like? So that was all taken into account with the net present value analysis. We looked at revenues over 20 years compared to the operating and maintenance costs. Um, so I can, I can provide that information. Uh, we have it here. We have the cash flows over 20 years, but I can certainly provide that information to you. Um, but that is what resulted in the net present value analysis showing that AMI is the most economical, both the revenues and expenses were looked at together. Yeah are we using uh, reserves in order to finance this project? Uh, we are not utilizing reserves, so this is budgeted. Um, I mean, we look at reserves year to year as far as maintaining an adequate level of reserves. But because this project, it actually, unlike a lot of our other projects, this results in a cost savings. So this is actually going to help our reserves as opposed to 
put a strain on our reserves. It does require an initial investment, though. You factored to get this those in revenues. when you did your rate analysis, correct? Uh, I don't. I don't think the AMI was specifically looked at, but this is in our budget. Okay. So, yeah, this is budgeted. But will it create any rate increases over the next ten years? This particular project shouldn't, because it, it like I said, it will actually save us money. So, um, mm -hmm. what's really going to drive our rate increases or potential increases that we're going to need to look at in the future is more of our pipelines, our assets that need to be upgraded. Um, it, but this project in particular, this should not um, impact any kind of rate increases. Um, one of the questions that I provided to you in writing beforehand um, was a, a request that asking other systems, what has their ROI been? I mean, it's great if we run our analysis, but we don't have a system implemented yet, so we really don't know what other utilities have actually mm -hmm. seen as far as ROI. And you said, well, we didn't really ask their different size utilities, they're different whatever, but I, um, I'm very hesitant about this project, as you know, because mm -hmm. it's a huge thing. And um, for instance, I myself have what I, it's a, it's a flume smart meter that is on my house. And that tells me immediately through Wi-Fi data whether how much water I'm using. It's a $150 device. And I put it in my window, and it tells me my outdoor usage. It tells me my indoor usage. It gives me alerts if there's any leaks. I just want to make sure we've looked at any and every other technology. And just because this one is the nice bells and whistles, that we are really looking at what is the most cost-effective technology available mm -hmm. now in the future. Um, so I'm, I'm very hesitant about this project. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is uh, what Commissioner Flowers touched on, and I think we're going to have a huge lift of education with our reclaimed water customers because if they did indeed, and I think we should find out what the average household paid to connect to reclaim water. I mean, it was hugely unpopular when it was implemented in 19, around 1998. Um, I remember in the beach communities, they were forced to take, I mean, we just, you know, we basically said, everybody's gonna get charged. You get a user fee or you get, you know, just a, an availability fee. And I, I you know, I understand the rationale behind doing it, and I understand that it's now a limited resource, but I do think there's going to be some very angry people. And commissioners, what Commissioner Seals referring to, she sent a number of questions um, that Megan responded to, and, and so she did give us those in advance. And so Megan, you know, has had a chance to look at the questions and kind of prepare to, yeah. to respond. <clears throat> yeah, so I can. And she can Gave me a good, you know, very accurate response, but I still think that we don't have ROI on other systems. And, um, you know, we, this is basically a 20 year project. So in 20 years, then we have to replace the, the you know, system pretty, it looks like pretty much the meters all over again. So I think the, um, the big difference here is if we're replacing, we're going to replace meters one way or another. Um, correct. We have to. And, by doing it this way, there's a cost effectiveness. So without all the other benefits of AMI, it's still a cost effective system just for the collection of the data. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. an upfront usage of capital, but it's a lower operating cost, a much lower operating cost. Yeah. Um, and then you get the, uh, the added benefit of accuracy, you get the added benefit of real time data and things like that. Uh, Megan did look at you know implementing the flume that you, you discussed that you um, have at your house. Um, and, and even with that, we still have to upgrade the meters. And so as upgrading the meters, it still would end up costing us more. So I, that's, that's the reason I think that they're pushing that this really is the you know, kind of way to go. This is not a new technology. It's not like we're first in on this. Um, many places have implemented it. I implemented it in Lake County where I was at before. Um, and we had, we had limited you know, areas where, it, I mean, we were kind of in the first realm of implementation, so I don't have that return. But the customer response was huge. 
Um, I mean, I, I remember real-time customers where they found that leak that had been leaking that they wouldn't have got until the end of that 60-day billing cycle. Um, and they were able to catch it and, be, and notify the customer you know, within days. And so there's, there is a lot of benefit, and I, I agree with you on the education piece, um, especially around the reclaim, which is different, obviously, than the water. Um, but, but there's a lot of real benefits to having um, new information and, and using technology to uh, improve our system. Yeah, and I, just following up on the question or the comments Commissioner Seal was making, we said the rates, you don't, you don't anticipate rates changing I'm assuming you're saying that the bill that they get is not changing, but are we are we using semantics? In other words, are the rates when you tell not raising is that including any meter costs that have to be implemented? Um, no, that so for the reclaimed water system because this is a new meter that was never installed, that will require a, a user fee to be established. So we are going to be looking at the direct costs associated with that and coming up with a payment plan for customers for that user fee. Um, so that will be on the reclaim water side. Also, just to clarify, I, you know, I think the question before was more on the drinking water rates, if you will. Um, and my point was just that in a project that saves money, <laughs> rates are driven by increased costs. So in a project that saves money, you're not actually going to impact your rates. But on the reclaimed water uh, meters, we are going to be transitioning customers to a new proposed rate structure. Now, initially, it will not be a tiered rate structure like you mentioned. We want to start customers off on um, essentially including a sort of um, usage amount in the base fee that they currently pay now. We calculated that uh, to be approximately 15,000 gallons a month. So that's what we're going to be recommending as we implement this project is, hey, you pay the same amount. You can use 15,000 gallons a month, which is, you know, we looked at IFAS standards, we calculated, we added a safety factor of 20%, so it should be plenty of water for the average uh, property owner to maintain their landscape. Anything above that amount then would be charged just a volumetric rate of $1.47 per 1,000 gallons, um, which is similar to other volumetric rates we have uh, for some of the commercial multifamily home properties. So that will change. Um, it, it, but and maybe maybe yeah. that's something that would be helpful to mm -hmm. understand a little better. I, 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 I certainly understand the concern. I don't see it on the on the water side, and we have had some pretty big increases in in our rate not water rates but our set, our sewer rates. But sure. Um, so I think we're sensitive to that on the water side because this is a new meter and because the cost system is less going this route. I think we'll be okay, but on the reclaim side, it would be nice to see how a typical reclaimed bill is now for our, mm -hmm. our resident and what it might look like after the fact. Um, sure, we can know, provide to, that. Yeah, just so that we can actually see that incremental change. Um, yeah, hold, hold one second, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Seal, did you have any other question? I, I kind of jumped in uh, there, I apologize. Just, just so the, you know, kind of a notation that a lot of the savings come from labor costs and from vehicle costs, and that's um, then invested in the cellular meter reading, the network, and the software. So as long as we don't have increases like we do with business technology services, <laughs> we should be fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I view this change uh, similar to the one that um, Duke Energy took when it was Progress Energy. They went to the meters that they installed so that their vehicles literally drive down the street and the data comes into their system that way so they're not sending persons onto the property anymore to actually read the meter like how they used to. I used to get dinged all the time because I wouldn't leave my gate open. I forgot to leave my gate open so they could get in. So they would have to do an estimated cost. So this, mm -hmm. this works well. Um, so this question, part of the cost savings analysis, is that going to be staff? Yes, we are looking at some savings uh, for staff. Um, we, the approach there will likely be, we'll still need some technicians. Um, they will transition to a different you know, classification. Right now it's just physically reading meters. We might need more advanced skill levels, so we'll have to do some training. 
And we think we can do it through attrition. Uh, meter, the meter reading uh, job class is typically, a lot of it is entry level. Uh, people stay for a couple years. There's a lot of turnover. But I don't foresee any need to, uh, you know, reduction in force. I think we can retrain people. We have plenty of jobs for our maintenance uh, workers, et cetera, that um, I think we can train people to get into. So that would be good. Yeah. To he that would be good to hear. Um, the other question that I have is, I understand that uh, utilizing an outside source would allow us to implement this process uh, faster because those persons who would be doing it internally would set aside some of the other work that they do in order to get these meters. Um, is there a plan to train individuals internally so that if something were to happen or go wrong or maybe that organization gets behind um, or whatever that we have people internally that would know how to implement, you know, how to engage or install, I guess is the word I need, <laughs> install the systems and, mm -hmm. and keep them going. Yeah, so our staff is pretty well trained on installing meters and boxes. So they, it's just the fact that we're trying to do it so rapidly that we don't have the staff to do it. So they, they are capable of doing that. The part that we don't have in-house is the integration and that network software billing integration. That's that technology piece that we don't have the internal um, support to do that. So that would be difficult to do in-house. Additionally, through this contract, we, we have some performance guarantees that if there's a problem, they need to fix it instead of us kind of scrambling around. And if customer, you know, you can imagine if, if it's not managed properly with, with performance that if customers aren't getting the right bill and, you know, it can, it can create some havoc. So that's why we, wanna, we wanted to do it as a turnkey approach and make sure we had some performance guarantees. But yeah, we do have staff trained to do that. And Barry, does this fall in line with, um, or would this be a part of looking at the overall uh, technology system upgrades that we're trying to do so that things are cohesive within the county? Or well, this would be a one of those separate need to be separate. Well, this will be this will be separate. BTS, I don't I don't think BTS supports you on this uh, at all. You, this is pretty much internal, but I'd have to ask Megan on that. Yeah, the network and software. It would be network and software as a service. So the Badger would be responsible for providing the support. That 10 year, you know, $10 million that we talked about, they're gonna provide ongoing support uh, with any issues that we have. And we would certainly work with BTS on anything any we Any connectivity need to to issues that, or things, but, yeah. but it's an outsourced service. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and I think one of the things when we get that bill comparison, just so we, from an educational standpoint, um, we start talking about it to our residents, one of the biggest problems, that, well, many of the problems they've had with the system is just availability of product. Mm -hmm. and I, think, I do think the changes will make product more available, um, but it's also just simple as repairing your system, you know, repairing mm -hmm. the sprinkler system and making sure you plan it right and your, you know, the repair people do it right with you guys because a lot of times we shut the water off, the reclaim off, and you have to have it on to get fixed. And there's just a lot of benefits, I think, that will come to the residents. Mm -hmm. But I do think people are, you know, cautious and careful about how their rates are affected. So sure. it'll be interesting to see. But there will be significant benefits, I think, for the residents. But yeah. um, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Seal, do you have anything else on that? Thank you for, um, no, not at the present time. I'll just look forward to getting the P&L data that was, um, and getting some kind of ROI from other systems, just to make sure that this will be as viable as it's stated. Yeah, I and did. We'll, uh, we'll follow up on that. Yeah, and I do, is it, is it, I did find out that um, it looks like uh, Dunedin is transitioning from AMR to AMI, and they're about 40% complete. I don't know what issues they're running into. They okay. won't have that data that she, Commissioner Seal's asking about yet, but they, they are transitioning themselves, so there might be somebody that you can okay, talk great. with. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm next on the agenda, so keep, I, keep, keep <laughs> I just going. keep going with the next presentation. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so wanted to just uh, provide some background and context uh, moving on to our next presentation, uh, the overarching purpose of our private sewer lateral policy options that, uh, again, we came to you in May 
of this year and discuss those options and, and use that feedback to move forward. Uh, so just as a background, the Wastewater Stormwater Task Force was formed in 2016 and had developed a strategic action plan aimed to reduce or eliminate sewer overflows in our collection system. One of the action plan items was the development of policies that would address inflow and infiltration into the private portions of our sewer system. Today, we are pleased to say that we have prepared a set of policies that we believe are both effective and practical at addressing this issue. We've been working with our wastewater collection program consultant, Wade Trim, on developing details of these proposed private sewer lateral ordinances and policies for the selected options presented to the board in May. And the development of these policies has involved input from multiple stakeholders. So today we're looking forward to your input and hopefully consensus to move forward. So your agenda packet contains um, all the language, the final language, proposed language for the ordinances, the associated policies with the options, and we're ready to move forward to a public hearing on any or all of these options. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce Chris Haney with Wade Trim to present the information. Thank you, Director Ross. Hello and good morning again. I'm Chris Haney, Senior Vice President with Wade Trim. I'm the principal in charge for the Wastewater Collection System Program. We're here today to update you on the progress we've made on the private sewer lateral policy since our last visit with the board on May 6th of this past year. Uh, we're here today to present a new policy proposed for private systems. If you recall from the last meeting, we presented information on the fact that both the public side and the private side of PCU's wastewater collection system contributes to inflow and infiltration, or I&I, &I, which is the primary cause of SSOs in the PCU system. PCU has been working diligently to address the public side of the collection system, and there are several projects programmed in the current CIP. The private side of the collection system, however, including private sewer laterals and private systems, are the focus of today's work session. Could you, uh, I think, say the that one sentence uh, again with all, you had all the all the letters and acronyms in there? I think for our residents to understand. Uh, make sure that they're sure. connecting this problem with the overflow problem. So Correct. if you could say that. So <clears throat> essentially, um, it was the it was the, it was the sentence that started with uh, oh I don't know. Uh, <laughs> then you. Uh, yeah. I'll just I'll just go back over it. So um, you know from the last meeting we presented information on the fact that both the public side of the collection system and the private side, which is within the private homeowner's property, both of those parts of the system contribute to inflow and infl infl infiltration, which is I&I. &I. And that is the primary cause of sanitary sewer overflows, or SSOs, yep. in the PCU system. Thank you. Yes, the, sir. The sanitary sewer overflow, which Correct. is a real issue and a real problem that our residents don't like to deal with. So we just want to make sure that that connection is made. Thank you. No problem. Okay, and uh, that's a good segue to this slide here. So really the main reason why we're here is SSO elimination. So in addition to the impacts that SSOs have on public health, water quality, and the environment, there are two overarching issues driving the need for private sewer lateral and private system policies, which we're here today to discuss with you. The first issue is that PCU continues to see SSOs during heavy rain events due to I&I &I entering the system as shown in the first photo on the left. With the red dots reflecting the highest volume of SSOs over the past eight years. So this is real data that's been captured and, and portrayed here in the image. Now reducing I&I &I at the source before it gets downstream to the treatment plants and creates SSOs is the most cost-effective strategy to eliminating SSOs. Otherwise, this increased flows enter, entering the sewer system will make its way to the wastewater treatment plants that are already at their capacity and, and would require far more greater uh, and more costly plant expansions. The second issue 
driving these policies is that your, waste, your largest wastewater plant, the South Cross Bayou plant, is already under a consent order, meaning the early steps of more intense and far more costly regulatory enforcement already exists. These private policies are aimed at reducing these risks for any further regulatory enforcement for PCU. So that's a really important aspect of what we're trying to avoid here. So now I'll update you on the policies. We have four policies, three of which we presented to you back in May, which include fine and fix, permitting, and rebate policies. We received your feedback and have worked diligently with Director Ross and her team, as well as the county attorney's office to incorporate this feedback into these policies. And as a quick recap, the fine and fix policy is a PCU-led and funded initiative which identifies defective laterals for repair in targeted areas in conjunction with the ongoing public system rehabilitation program within the PCU system. The permitting policy is when there are sewer capacity related property improvements requiring a building permit that prompts inspection and corrective action if needed. And the rebate policy is where the county provides funding for inspections and or corrective actions of the private lateral after it is implemented by the property owner. So in addition to those three policies, we have developed a private system policy which focuses on private systems which typically serve strip malls and other commercial developments as well as manufactured home communities. This policy seeks to implement additional permitting and inspection of these systems to make sure they meet local and state regulations for operations and maintenance. Another driver for this policy is to hopefully minimize these types of systems and the associated risks they pose for operational related issues and I&I &I in the future if possible. Now we will present the policy components, cost, and key aspects for the implementation of each policy, starting with find and fix. So this is the policy that will achieve the greatest I&I &I reduction under this program. The goal of this policy is to reduce I&I &I from private sewer laterals as part of the ongoing public collection system rehab program, as I previously mentioned. All of this work will be led and funded by PCU. Since our last meeting with you, we have advanced our work to identify initial priority areas in the system. This map shows an overview of these priority areas, with the largest areas including Leelman and Seminole Boulevard. These areas are based on historical data of the system, age of the system, and SSO data in the adjacent areas. There are a couple of other areas to note, such as areas at Brian Derry Road and Starkey Road near the top of the image, and an area between Park Boulevard and 82 just west of Starkey Road in the center of the image. Our analysis shows that utilizing a find and fixed approach to target the private laterals in these areas can reduce I and I and downstream flow meters from 25 to 55%, which is very significant. This work will take about 10 years to complete at a pace of about 19,000 linear feet per year, which is about 3.6 miles per year, and up to 340 private sewer laterals per year at a cost of approximately $5 million annually. By doing this work in this manner, PCU can expect significant capital cost avoidance of upwards of 25 to $50 million or more for additional flow attenuation storage and pumping facilities that will otherwise be required to manage the peak flow conditions in the system due to INI. You can see in the table the associated costs for these policies as well as an estimated cost to manage items such as temporary construction easements and the associated engineering services for designing and building and overseeing construction of these projects. We anticipate this work will utilize a design build delivery method to expedite the work which provides PCU a contractor team with a single source responsibility to manage both the engineering and construction services. As this program continues, we expect to find other pockets of area and areas within the system that can be programmed and prioritized in the find and fix program. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes, sir. Before we move on to the, that next one, that um, $5 million annual cost, I mean, over 10 years is a long time. Right. Those costs are going to go, I would assume, the estimated cost for today, 10 years from now, are going to be dramatically different. I mean, for the services and for the actual, is is the timing of doing 19,000 feet per year and whatever else we're doing per year, is that based on, uh, well, what's that based on uh, as far as, if we had $50 million to do it today, how long would it take us? 
Well, <clears throat> good question. I would think that things could be accelerated, uh, but uh, as of right now, you know, looking at the CIP and looking at uh, other factors, um, you know, that's a pretty good pace that we're that we're forecasting here. But certainly, there's there's opportunities to, you know, accelerate or or, you know, bundle large, larger projects together into a single project or have multiple concurrent projects underway. So, as who knows what we're getting in federal money from the next thing that we certainly could cut this time. Ten years just seems like a, a really long time. Well, and it's, it's feeding into a, a treatment plant that we have a consent order on. So the sooner we can get that work done and tighten up our system, the better. Yeah. Agreed. Um, again, just wanted to make sure we may not have the answers, but this five million a year or I guess 50 million roughly over the 10 year period just to take care of these areas. Um, adding to the cost of our sewer system and rates thereof, right? So we're, we're not talking about bonding these projects. They're not big enough for that. S that would maybe spread it out over a longer period of time. So I'm assuming we're compressing it in the period in which we're spending it. Which again, I think, again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just sure. trying to make sure that all these little elements that we talk about, the major dollars that we're spending on that plant right now, we had something last month that was, I don't remember. Right. It was a, and the, this project here add to those continued pressures on our sewer rates. And I, I'm just trying to think of alternative ways to, to your point about using some outside funding to capitalize this project to keep those that rate pressure under control. Well, as you know, one of the other items on the agenda is the ARPA funds, and we have some projects that are within um, this uh, the sewer and water area. Um, but, but looking at the infrastructure, the federal infrastructure money, we're going to certainly be looking at that. That is a primary target. So to the extent we can offset cost um, uh, with federal, state or federal money, we will certainly um, be aggressive in pursuing that. I think you know one of the things you've seen over the last couple of years is Megan's approach to really tightening up our wet water and wastewater system, and you know so yeah. Yeah, it, it it impacts rates. I mean I, I I understand that, but the alternative is that we have SSOs spilling out into our streets, yeah. um, and that's not acceptable. And so you know they're making a concerted effort to really go after it more aggressively uh, fixing uh, some of our systems and these particular areas are are the are highlights of, of where uh, we need to do a lot more yeah uh, so it really comes down to how it's getting paid for and how that adds to the rate structure correct. because I don't think yeah. we're getting a lot of argument about whether these are good things to right. do it's just about how do we do it how do we pay for it so that we're not just you know hitting but, but on the same side, we have a lot of capital improvements that are planned for our system mm -hmm. um, that you've seen as part of the rate analysis. If we're able to offset that cost um, through state or federal grants, well, then that frees up monies to be able to do programs like this without impacting rates yeah. or right. minimally impacting yeah. rates. So we're, I guess that's we're, we're going to do everything we can to minimize the impact on rates on yeah. this. This is, yeah. yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, Megan Ross, um, you know, not doing it aggressively just runs the risk of a more uh, rigorous consent order and or consent decree, which will then put us on a timeline that we do not control and we will have to do it <laughs> in that time frame, and it will require rates, et cetera, whatever we have to do. So we certainly want to be proactive. That way we're in the driver's seat of, of the decisions and the financing and the timeline and so I just wanted to add that as well as, um, you know, like Barry said, any kind of uh, monies that we can get from infrastructure will assist with this. But also as far as, because we are addressing the private side, keep in mind, we've got to get easements, access, you know, that, that might take some time, but we certainly want to, we are looking at alternative project delivery methods to get it done as quickly as possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Chairman, you're good? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna to move to the permitting policy update. The goal of this policy is to require the property owner to inspect and repair the property's sewer lateral when major home improvements occur, which are defined in the policy components. 
So a few examples here. So first, this could be when plumbing fixtures are added or replaced in a home that increases wastewater flows into the wastewater collection system. Or it could be when the construction of a home improvement is 50% or greater of the assessed value and the property is in the floodplain, also known as the FEMA 50% rule. Another example is when the property owner submits a, a building permit application for additional square footage of 70 square feet or more to accommodate additional occupants within the property, which increases sewer flows to the sewer system. And then finally, when there's a demolition or rebuild component to the property, which based on Florida building code requires inspection of a sewer pipe under a slab that leads to a sewer main if the plumbing in the residential building is completely replaced. The county requires a demolition permit when plumbing is replaced in any structure or when a residential permit is pulled for new construction. So property owners who have had their private laterals either installed, replaced, or have an inspection demonstrating that the lateral is not defective within the last 10 years would be exempt from this policy. Some of the costs for implementing this policy includes the administrative cost to the building services department, which would be recouped by the permit review fee. Based on the 2020 building permit database, we anticipate approximately 200 permit applications annually that will initiate a private sewer lateral inspection. We would need one new administrative FTE, which is forecasted at $58,000 annually, to implement this policy along with uh, utilizing existing county resources. And we would need public outreach, which is budgeted for about $20,000 annually. So the total estimated annual cost for the permitting policy is $78,000. The cost for private lateral inspections under this policy will be borne by the property owner, and the property owner can apply for a rebate to cover this inspection if they meet the rebate requirements. Um, so yes, sir. Uh, I look at these, these policy components when, when it would trigger that. Um, I mean, you know, the 50% rule or the demolition and rebuild, I mean, those are fairly costly improvements. Right. So a, a private lateral to fix it, what would that be, 5,000? You, know, you know, so adding that to a construction project, though costly, at least, you know, it's a smaller part of it. These other right. items, when you do these additional plumbing fixture, it, it, doesn't have to be very expensive, right? It would trigger a pretty expensive deal. Well, it would, yeah. it would trigger the inspection. So if the inspection came back right. and said, "Hey, you got a problem," then you could apply for the rebate to help offset that cost. Okay. Okay. Same. Okay. All right. And so we will. Yeah. The rebate being again, um, how much of the cost are you talking about? Up to fifty percent or thirty-five hundred dollars. Whichever is greater. Right. So it's it's a way it's it's a if you recall back from our discussions in May, it was trying to find a balance of when do you trigger that inspection. We go we could require every inspection for um, you know on homes, and then we get a lot of pushback and and, and so um, access and things like this. We were trying to find a balance, and that seemed to be when they're increasing the capacity to the sewer system as a fair point in which to trigger that inspection. Um, it's part of a construction project. You already have permits and, and all the other things that go on, and that seemed to be a, a, a pretty common place to trigger um, that additional review. Again, at the end of the day, people want to know if there's, I guess, they're, they're not leaks. They're really leaks getting into their infiltration Correct. problems. It's Correct. not leaks onto their property. Could be either, but yeah. But so I'm thinking of motivations for folks that, you know, I mean, they're well, helping the collective system, of course, and that's important and the sewage spills and all of that. Right. But, um, but if you're, if you're doing a major, you know, rehab of your house, well then yeah, it'd be the time to fix it. Right. And, and then here we offer a rebate, um, to help offset that cost. Fair, fair way of doing it. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Seal. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the, um, in addition to the presentation, the written policy information that we got. And it says, I'm kind of curious about this, that if you've had 
inspection demonstrating that the lateral is not defective within the last 10 years that they are exempt from this policy, why did we pick 10 years? I mean, I trees grow and laterals can be, I, I could see five years, but 10 years seems pretty long. Yeah, I would just say that's the number we kind of settled on. Um, just from a collective standpoint of, of experience uh, across the team that we've got compiled to do this work, Megan? Yeah, you know, that number is flexible. You know, if, I, if the board is comfortable more with five years, we can do five years. But in the last, you know, in the last 10 years, if you had a, a permit, a, a full-on sewer lateral replaced, and you had a permit and it was inspected, it's likely going to be PVC. I mean, it's just a little bit more of a robust material. It's not like a corroded iron pipe or something or a clay pipe. Those are really the ones, or Orangeburg, you know, that roots grow into. So, I mean, we just kind of picked 10 years um, because of the lifespan of a, of a more modern PVC installation. But if the board does feel comfortable with lessening that time frame, we can certainly adjust that. I just want to make sure that, you know, we effectively capture, you know, any issues. Um, if you're really comfortable with 10 years, I'm fine. But I just was curious. I thought that was a pretty lengthy period of time. Um, the other question I had was, it states that they have to do the improvements within 365 calendar days after the initial finding that the private sewer lateral is defective. Um, what makes them do it? What are we going to do if they don't do it? <laughs> and we've given them a year to fix it. What's our, what's... <clears throat> We've already given them a certificate of occupancy for their rebuild or, you know, right. new addition. So, so how do we force the fact that we've given them a year to fix the lateral and they don't fix it? We, at that point, would have to initiate our uh, code enforcement uh, mechanisms that is in our, um, it's in our, our sewer use ordinance. So we would initiate basically fines and progressive fines at that point. Why couldn't you make it a condition of their CO? We we talked about that uh, with the county attorney, and I believe the um, the concern there was that those two ordinances could not conflict. We cannot use one ordinance to hold up a permit, and that was you know that was the advice that we were given from the county attorney. So that's why, uh, in addition. Um, you know, we want to give people time, you know, if it is a significant expense that they were not anticipating and it's thousands of dollars, we certainly don't want to hold up issuance of doing whatever they need to do um, on the remainder of their home and then give them time to do that. But that was advice from the county attorney that we could not hold up the permit um, with this policy. I'm not talking about the permit, I'm talking about the certificate of occupancy, which usually you're checking the box saying, this is all about life safety codes. And to me, this is a life safety code. You certainly yeah. would want to make sure the sewer system is operating properly. Let's say if you added a new bathroom and your lateral is not fixed, that's not such a good thing. <laughs> sure. And, uh, sure. <laughs> Blake can speak to that a little bit. Um, Blake. Good morning. Blake Line, Director of Building and Development Review Services. Commissioner Seal. The certificate of occupancy, just for a point of clarification, is for brand new construction, so we would certainly look at that. If you do have a situation where it's a repair and or an addition, it's a certificate of completion, so it's a little bit different uh, mechanism that we would have to use to look at. So they, they wouldn't get a new CO for something that's a remodel or a repair system. We can look at it at the completion of that, and they can, we can hold up a, you know, a final inspection uh, but it wouldn't be the certificate of occupancy. That would only be for brand new residents, brand new home. Okay, well, thanks for the clarification, but can you add it to the certificate of completion? Again, you wouldn't want to have a brand new bathroom that's, you know, for instance, that's been added that's not properly connected. Certainly, and we could do that as part of the, um, one, of, one of the things that I was working with Megan and her team on was, you know, the inspections, the permitting type, 
uh, and we would do that as part of our final inspection. So typically what would happen in this type of scenario is as a property owner came in to repair that lateral or to do the work on the home, we go through and we do what we call rough inspections, which are the initial early inspections as the work's starting. And then when they get into completing that work, we have a final inspection. So we can make sure that that is part of the final inspection, that that work's done accurately. Thank you. Um, Megan. Um, also, you, these are these are the triggers that you're talking about. And I remember the last conversation that we had because you've identified areas that that we're going to go in and look. Also, as a you know, like we're going to go to let's a few blocks in one of the uh, one of those areas that you highlighted. Um, so we're trying to you know we're mobilizing. I think I remember the word being the mobilization cost is already there. Um, is there a way to say, look, we're going to be in the area to look at our own system right now and seeing what issues we have um, and letting them have an option to have, I mean, I know that you're showing this, that they have to do the, their own inspection, but is there a way to, I mean, save money? We're talking the rebates 50% or $3,500, again, whichever is greater is what I heard. Um, it, is there ways to cut down on that cost of the overall thing if we're mobilized in there where they would do work for us, but they would also go on and do the private? Uh, I mean, I'm just, I know it's a little complicated to, to work together. But. Yeah, that's what the find and fix represents is that in those oh. areas where we are going to be doing public work that we would go ahead and do the inspections and, and lining on the private side as well. But as far as just going around and doing inspections everywhere, you know, that just, that's part of the, the issue that we uh, face is that it requires a right of entry. You know, it requires some sort of an easement or right of entry because it is private property. So having the county initiate that, there's a lot of burden that comes along with having the county sort of knock on your door and want to inspect your private lateral as opposed to the homeowner initiating that yeah. and us just providing that incentive or requirement to do so. So that's why things like the permitting and the rebate where it's homeowner initiated kind of meets that uh, balance between us being invasive versus the customer initiating. So that's why we're limiting that county initiation to the find and fix areas because you know we're gonna have to go door to door and get approval from each homeowner and potentially not get approval. I mean, some homeowners just may not wanna do it, but the rebate allows that just that market driven incentive that I'm a homeowner and I'm going to initiate it and I'm going to get the work done and I'm sort of just incentivizing you to do that. Okay. So the find and fix is a, when you're going to be in an area. Yeah. That Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I was confusing the two policies. Okay. Go ahead. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Slides not advancing here. Okay. We need some help with the slides. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Rebate policy. So we just talked about this a little bit, but to give you a formal update. So this policy's goal is to reduce groundwater and surface water uh, in the form of I and I entering the collection system from defective private laterals by incentivizing property owners to inspect, repair, or replace their private laterals by providing up to a 50% rebate for the associated cost. The picture on the right as an example uh, of a recently replaced private sewer lateral in an open trench from the street to the home. Key policy components include when the rebate process is initiated by the property owner, a PCU pre-qualified plumber or contractor must perform the inspection on the private sewer lateral. We estimate this policy will address approximately 150 to 250 homes annually. In the table, you'll see that the policy includes up to a maximum of $350 per property for the initial inspection and an anticipated annual cost of about $100,000. The rebate will be offered to pay for up to 50% or $3,500 per property for the repair or replacement of the lateral with total annual cost estimated at $700,000. This policy will require one full-time equivalent for administrative purposes to be hired at $58,000 to help manage this rebate program. 
Public outreach is required to get the word out through mailers, social media and meetings, et cetera, for 20K per year. And the total estimated annual cost is 878,000 for the rebate policy. Yeah, Commissioner Gerard. So a couple of questions about that. Um, yes. So this is something that a homeowner could request. Correct. The county come out and do. It's a, it's a homeowner initiated policy, yes ma'am. Okay, and then if the inspection, the homeowner arranges the inspection, if it shows that they don't need to replace it, do they still get reimbursed for the inspection? Uh, if they if there's no inspection, they get reimbursed for the inspection, yes. If they're, yeah, okay, thanks. If, yeah, if there's no replacement, they get reimbursed Correct. for the inspection. Correct, if there is a replacement needed, then they get the, they get the rebate of the 50% or up to $3,500. Um, again, you just said something different. I want to make sure I hear. Is it the greater of 50% or 3,500, or is it 50% up to 3,500? It's up to 50% or 3,500 per property. That's so. It's the it's the it, it's it's the it's the lesser of. I guess I, I just no, want to. No, it's it's capped at 3,500. Period. Right. Yeah. So like I could get a lining or a replacement for two thousand dollars. I get reimbursed a thousand. But then if it's you know. It's the lesser of the two. Right. So if it's so ten thousand dollars, I'm still only getting 3,500. Yeah. It's not yeah. the great. That's why I said it earlier. It's the greater right. of, yeah. and you, everybody <laughs> nodded their head. So I said, make sure right. the, the key lesser. Is, the key is fifty percent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then it's yeah. capped at 3,500. Yeah. So it is okay. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah. No. It's all right. Any other questions? Okay. Now we're gonna talk about the private system policy. This is a new policy aimed at requiring privately owned collection systems, pump stations, and force mains to obtain operations permits as well as construction permits to reduce operational risks and minimize new private systems in the future. The typical properties that utilize these systems are strip malls, manufactured home communities, condominiums, and other commercial developments like the one shown in the right of the slide. The policy components include a system-wide inventory and characterization of the private systems within the PCU system. Permitting, inspection, operations, and management include, including enforcement, setting O&M performance standards and requiring SSO response plans that include backup and emergency power provisions and public outreach. This policy will require at least four new time staff to manage the program and lead inspections. The County City Works asset management system could be used to support this policy as well. Each FTE is estimated to be $116,000 per year, which includes fringe benefits for a total of $464,000 per year. The public outreach requires a budget of $20,000 annually, but will need $50,000 in startup costs for the first year to stand up the policy and properly inform the public through a much more formal public outreach campaign, as well as the usual billing inserts, mailers, neighborhood meetings, and social media uh, options. The initial inventory and characterization work associated startup costs are approximately $300,000, which would include desktop evaluations to identify the potential private sewer systems, field inventories, surveys, and data entry into the city works and GIS systems. Based on these assumptions, the annual budget for the private sewer system policy would be $484,000. However, the initial startup cost, as mentioned, would require an additional $350,000 for public outreach and completion of the inventory. Uh, could you give me an example of a private system policy? I'm seeing a like a looks like a large commercial pro property. Right. So if this commercial property has a series of uh, laterals that tie to a single collection system line, that would be considered a private system before it enters the Pinellas County system. Okay. So you have those in their manufactured home communities, condominiums. There's. There's a lot of them in Pinellas County. Yeah. So we're Not, working. I was uh, residential. I was thinking of, and you were showing commercial, but it's both. This is both. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
So the program in total is seven new people? Is that, um, Overall, I believe that's the number, yes, sir. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, Pat. I do have one other. Um, do we have subsidies for the private collection system to fix them? In terms of the rebate? Yeah. Uh, I don't believe the rebate applies to the private systems. Okay. Because some of those are pretty big, particularly the mobile home parks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jill has something to say. <laughs> Thank you, Jill Silverboard, Deputy County Administrator. We are applying, uh, as we've shared with yep. you through the ARPA and possibly even the infrastructure. We have a, a strategy for the 15 manufactured housing communities um, that we've identified as kind of being worst first. Um, so we are seeking dollars that could help us offset the cost of, of this particular policy. Okay. And re you know, remember that for our for her sewer system, for the sewer system, really some unincorporated and incorporated areas because it flows into our system. And so this is gonna be key, as you well know, on some of these manufactured home communities. The maintenance is suspect, you know, so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a community, right? St. Pete, is it St. Pete Beach? What, what's a community that flows into our system? Is it, am I, am I confusing? Oh, yeah, yeah, you've got a, there's a lot of. of yeah, uh, St. Pete Beach flows into the city of St. Pete's system, but Madeira Beach, for example. Oh, okay. Bel Air, um, Treasure Island flows into actually the St. Pete system as well. Yeah, but. Um, but these dollars we're talking about are in the unincorporated areas. This is in our entire sewer service area. So all of the cities and unincorporated anywhere where we own the sewer system is where this would apply. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the 300,000, that's just to give us an idea of how big the problem is or how big the situation is in inventory. Correct, yeah, so right now, because, it, you know, in the past, because these systems are private, they're not in our GIS database. You know, we don't own them, we don't track them, we, we, we just, it's kind of like a blank, <laughs> a blank dot. Uh, so we're going to have to understand where all these systems are, inventory, get them in our GIS, and, and really get a program stood up, you know, an inspection program stood up. So is that is that typical for like a condo development? I'm thinking like, for example, in, in West Lelman, five towns is unincorporated and it's, you know, probably 20 buildings. Is that, would that be an example of one, would that be a typical for a condo development to have their own system and then come in one pipe access to us or would they have multiple, I don't know what the typical. It's, you know, it's all over the place over the years of how the development took place. You know, some systems, they handed over that system to the county, you know, they, they built it out and then handed it over for us to own and then other systems decided to maintain a private system. I mean, it just, I don't know that there's any rhyme or reason to it, uh, but moving forward, we're looking at those development policies and having some standards and consistency in place for new developments or redevelopments. Thank you. Okay. Final questions? Um, no. Um, so the, again, I, I guess it's a, a utility rate question again. I'm, um, <clears throat> We have a utility rate, every, it's a uniform, everybody pays the same rate. Um, and we, the idea being that improvements in one area are absorbed into the overall rate system for everybody. Um, Tr true, so. okay. Megan, do you, are some of these on, are some of the mobile home parks, are they on a flat rate or are they, are they metered? How, how are some of those occurred? I, 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 yeah, I don't so know the answer to that. Typically with, uh, for example, the mobile home parks, their sewer bill will be based off their water. We'll have a meter on the water side, so there'll be a master meter okay. metering the water, and then that sewer bill is determined based on how much water consumption there is. 
like we would do on a residential home. There's a water meter. We base the sewer bill on the water uh, based on how much water consumption, you know, just based on the assumption that the water you're using right. is going down the drainage of the sewer. But of course, what we're seeing is we're getting a lot more sewer coming back. If they don't <laughs> much maintain more than, that, than the water that's being used because you've got the groundwater and everything. Yeah. So if in. they don't maintain that, yeah. there's no penalty for them. There's no incentive for them to, to yeah. keep their system tight. Yeah. And and that's the that's that change that really has to occur. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll have some other questions on that, but we'll do it later. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, going to the next slide. So I've concluded the discussion on the four policy options and the associated implementation costs. I'll give you an update on the overall wastewater collection system program. Uh, just to recap here, it's a five-year program that we kicked off earlier this year. We've successfully launched 10 of the 12 major tasks since our last meeting with you in May. Uh, task number three, the capital improvement program, will kick off later this month. Through October 2021, uh, Wade Trim and our subconsultants are approximately 20% complete with the overall project. In addition to task four, which is why we're here today, the private uh, system policies, private lateral policies and programs, we've made great progress with our public outreach efforts, which has included two open house events, meetings with key external stakeholders in the community to keep them informed and to solicit their feedback into these policies. We continue to coordinate with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program and the Pinellas County Wastewater and Stormwater Partnership. We're ramping up the funding strategies for several funding opportunities, some of which you're aware that look very promising to provide critical funding to large parts of this program. Uh, we continue to make progress on the septic to sewer program as well as other tasks uh, that include flow monitoring, which feeds into our hydraulic modeling development. And we recently, uh, completed a resiliency study for the backup power and fuel systems at PCU's 299 pump stations. So um, any questions on progress? Any questions? Commissioner okay. Seal, did you have any final questions? Okay. 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 I guess we're good. For just, the, just to add, I mean, you can, <laughs> what Megan and her team, you know, have taken on is significant. They're making monumental um, changes in both the capital infrastructure and investment, uh, but also in the policies and way we manage our water and wastewater systems um, through using, you know, Wade Trim and their consultants. Um, the, these are these these are generational type investments and. And they've taken they've taken it all on at once, <laughs> yeah. so they've got a lot going on, and they really should be commended for all the yeah. work that they're doing. Yeah, it, it is amazing. Thank you for saying that, Barry. It is truly amazing. Um, I just think I would say in, in closing, we've touched on it a few times that um, it's one thing for us to see it from our perspective, but always thinking of that cost benefit to the resident. Yep. So they they can see what those costs will be, but at the same time see what their direct benefits are, but also some indirect benefits that they may not care that much about them or they may care deeply about them. But I think that's sure. obviously important as you go, and I'm sure you're doing that all the time, but whether it's in the reclaimed area or whether it's in these, in these areas, I think those are mm -hmm. important things. Okay. Um, Great. I didn't hear anything from Commissioner Seal, and we're good here. So. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to yeah. present to you today. Thank you for all Happy your work. Appreciate yes, it. Thank you, Megan. Okay, on to code enforcement process. Yeah, there's been a lot of questions, you know, regarding code enforcement and some other work. Come on up, Jude. And um, so we wanted to give just a kind of an overview of our code enforcement process, what they're working on, work with the county attorney's office. And um, so Jude is here to uh, kind of uh, kind of do a recap and um, brief presentation regarding some of their efforts. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me. Well, my name is Jude Reason. I'm Pinellas County housing official and division manager for code enforcement. Uh, today I'm gonna briefly discuss some of our operations and kind of give you a crash course in our timelines uh, when it comes to our foreclosure and injunctive processes. To touch on a couple of stats, on a five-year average, code enforcement takes in about 20,000 calls a year, about 5,000 calls for services, amounting to about 4,300 cases, 
and ultimately ending in, in several hundred citations and special magistrate hearings. Over on the right side of our um, graphic here, you'll see our FY20 stats. Uh, FY20 is a little important because FY21, some of our stats have changed as we've taken on the, the responsibility of the PCCLB investigations. But in FY20, we did 20,000 investigations and inspections, conducted about 6,000 lien searches, and 1,100 citations. Uh, Jude, on those uh, inspections, 20,000 inspections, um, how many do you think were generated from calls coming into us? The majority of our cases are calls that come into us. However, we do have some proactive investigations that occur from officers who see stuff as they're out on the community making their routine patrols. Um, I don't have that specific number, but okay. I can get it for you. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. For sure. All right, though there are various ways to file a complaint with code enforcement from telephone to internet, the C Click Fix application is one that we use. And this graphic here kind of demonstrates code enforcement C Click Fix cases versus some of our counterparts throughout the county. You can see we carry a pretty heavy burden when it comes to some of the cases um, when compared to uh, some of the other departments. So in recent years, we've drastically improved our response times. Several of you may remember it used to take up to 30 days for an officer to initially arrive on a case. That drastically improved in, in roughly FY16. And in FY18, we dedicated a lot, of, uh, a lot of our resources to reducing that number, got it all the way down to three days um, for a first response, which was pretty significant and took quite a bit of effort. Uh, obviously, with support from you all, county administration, uh, as well as our director, Blake Lyon, and a dedicated team of code enforcement officers who really set the standard for presence here in Pinellas County. And I apologize, I want to back up and touch on one more thing. One of the other processes that we did to improve was our e-citation. And you may recall recognizing one of our officers in the past for developing a program that took us from several days down to a, a couple of minutes, um, which is a now a program that's utilized countywide. So we have various levels of enforcement. And as we go into these next slides, you're gonna see a, a color model that follows the level of enforcement. Starting with green, uh, which is the notice of violation. It's a simple warning. Um, this, this grants an opportunity for a citizen to correct a violation. It's a notification that's required by statute. And it gives an, uh, typically gives about a 30-day um, compliance period. As we move forward, the, level, the, the colors will intensify as the complexity of the cases do. So if, we are un, if we're unsuccessful, the notice of violation stage, we move to a citation. Citation is, uh, is essentially what's called a notice to appear, and it goes before the local ordinance violation court and can often accompany a, uh, a monetary fine if compliance is not achieved. From there, we move to our special magistrate. Uh, at the special magistrate phase, if again, if we're not successful, this is where a lien can be imposed on the property. And we can fall back on our injunctive process which is a program that we work with the county attorney on, can ultimately lead to compliance, a demolition, or even a foreclosure. This is something that occurs in, this, in, these, in the higher courts, the circuit court. And on those first two or three levels, what, what's the time frame for them? Like, you give a warning for, you give them 30 days, what do you? What do you, you know? Absolutely, in fact, the next couple of slides will okay. demonstrate that, okay. if I can get thank to you. that. Sir. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Right. So, this is our FY20 uh, compliance stats. We issued about 5,000 NOVs, so 100% of those received the written NOV, the opportunity for an, a, a citizen to correct the matter. Of that, only 23% had to go to local ordinance violation court. And of that, only 1.2 to the magistrate. And of that, only 0.16, less than a percent. Now this particular level is pretty noteworthy. These are the cases that typically come across your desk, grab the attention of county administration, and ultimately end up with those cat items that we see so often in code enforcement. <laughs> but what's noteworthy is that 77% of our citizens comply at the notice of violation stage. This is the no fine, the simple warning. This just allow, grants them the opportunity and educates them as to what the problem is, and then they correct it, 77%. I believe that's fairly successful. So it's an example of our case workflow, and here I've introduced a new color. So as the color model continues, the new color purple, that represents code enforcement and the time that we have control over. I mentioned that 30-day period before, we got it down to three, now we're down to 1.25 days. The first five blocks of this slide is that 1.25 days. From the day the complaint was received 
to the officer observing the violation and sending out the notice of violation. As the process progresses, where the green ends, that's the 77%. Again, it tends to intensify when we get all the way down to the foreclosures and demolition process. And we're gonna focus a little more heavily on that foreclosure block here shortly. So we're gonna get into the timelines. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, you, you had asked about that. So this is, about, this is where we'll um, identify some of those timelines. Um, CED is responsible for about three to six days. That includes mailing. The NOV authorizes 30 days. It can be up to 30 days for a citizen to make a correction. Now, occasionally we will grant additional time, but those are circumstances that have to be met and approved by uh, the, the supervisors. So 77% usually comply within the first three to 40 days. Now, as you can see, if we continue to elevate, local ordinance violation court can take as much as a year. Special magistrate can take as much as two years. And as we go on to the circuit court, it can be as much as 1,400 days. As we continue, I'm gonna kind of show you how that works out. So again, code enforcement responsible for about one to three days. The notice of violation, which is statutory, we have to give them that time, 30 days. Accounts for about 30 to 33 days for voluntary compliance is 77%. If we end up having to go to the uh, citation phase into the courts, we have to add that notice of violation time, add the time it takes to pr process through the courts, coming out to just under a year. If we go to the special magistrate phase, which is typically followed by the local ordinance violation court, we have to add all of that time, add the magistrate time as well, which is about 345 days. So we're just under two years before we reach compliance. Now again, that's only that 1.2%. If we go on to the injunctive process, foreclosure process, we're looking at a much greater time frame. We're currently taking almost two years for our injunctions to, re to achieve compliance, coming out to a total of 1,400 days. And it, bearing in mind, these are those cases that 0.16%, less than a percent of the cases that we have are seeing these kind of timelines. Fortunately, Florida Chapter 162, which is the governing standard for all code enforcement throughout the state of Florida, grants us an opportunity for foreclosure. This is a program the county hasn't moved forward on yet, but we are in the process. We have three on deck and we're working with the county attorney's office to get those through. In conjunction with the county attorney's office, we've created an eight-step process. Though it's made up of about 20 different entities, this is that one block that you saw in the earlier slide that gave us a case workflow, the foreclosure block. So obviously you can tell there are a lot of wheels spinning as we go through each of those phases. So working in conjunction with the county attorney's office, we developed this program and now we are able to identify those properties that may be eligible to move forward for a foreclosure action. Uh, are most of those foreclosed properties um, uh, vacated? Some are, uh, some have uh, squatters in them, some are in the process of being foreclosed. Okay. Um, th there are also a lot of folks that are living in these, in these homes. Okay. So currently, of these, of these cases, of these leaned properties that we went through the special magistrate on. This is a very fluid number. This is ever changing. In fact, it may have already changed today. But we have about 478 lean properties in the unincorporated portions of Pinellas. 118 of them, when this data was taken, were in homestead or foreclosure process, which means we can't touch them. Per statute, we don't have the opportunity to go into a, or into a homestead property and foreclose it. And properties that are in foreclosure, it, it doesn't really make sense for us to move forward on because we, we won't be effective. Le this leaves about 360 that are currently potentially eligible for foreclosure. Uh, there is obviously those eight step process that we have to follow to determine each one and we'll do each one case by case in conjunction with the county attorney's office. And we may run into several speed bumps on some of those properties. You may recall earlier this year in February, you helped us pass a string of ordinances and a resolution that allowed us to reduce the overall liens that were owed on these properties. We took that number from just under $350 million to just under $8 million. Uh, this, this helped citizens. Um, it basically gave them a, a much greater access and an opportunity to actually correct their violations, bring their properties into compliance, and pay down those liens. It also promoted a lot of reinvestment opportunity, and we are seeing success from that. Um, but what it did was ultimately reduce the overall liens um, and it makes it a little bit easier for us to move forward. Oh, Commissioner Flowers, thank you. This question may be better for Barry, I'm not sure. For the properties that are in foreclosure, 
that means that their property is reverting back to the lender bank or whatever institution. Do we not want to pass that lien on to them and as a way to make sure that they're at least trying to mow the property or remove the junk trash and debris or whatever, um, at the rate that properties are selling now, it may not be a long time, you know, by the time the property turns over, but it still kind of puts a little push on them to at least tidy it up and clean it up. Or if we have that lot clearing division go out and do it, it reimburses us for well, our costs. Well, first I'll let Jude answer that, but we don't have a lot um, mowing um, group. We may want to get one. But we that crew through the uh, lot clearing process, which is uh, yeah, by statute and ordinance. Okay, yeah, so sorry, go ahead and go ahead call and it lot sure, clearing. Yeah. Sure, yeah, abso absolutely. As part of our methodology, we do have lot clearings. We are budgeted to do that, and we utilize a contractor that comes in and helps us clear properties as well as secure properties, whether it be board up windows, um, and even go as far as demolition if we need to. Um, so th that is an option. However, uh, a couple of years back, uh, you may recall you, uh, you helped us pass the uh, foreclosure registry. Which, uh, which helps that, basically tackles that exact situation. The banks are held to a standard where they have to register these foreclosed properties and they have to have a property maintenance company maintain those properties. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they always do, and of course, we have to exercise enforcement action. But through various other legal, uh, legal issues, it, it becomes very difficult for us to maintain a lien on a property that's in the middle of foreclosure, and as it exchange hands, again, it can create additional legal um, concerns on being able to recuperate those funds. Yeah, uh, having served on the Code Enforcement Board, we often release those liens once that property changed hands. Sometimes you have people who, they will change hands to someone else, but they still really belong to the violator. Mm, <laughs> um, and so we did that as a mechanism to encourage someone coming in. But I was just thinking, you know, as a way to cover our costs, because we are paying, you know, to keep those properties up, because neighbors don't want that around them either. Um, but just, just, you know, kind of thinking. Absolutely. Thank you. Can you hear me, Commissioner Seal? Go ahead. Now I can, thank okay. you. I was just curious because I did initiate that foreclosure registry um, system. Is it working? Are we having compliance? Are we seeing some results from that? Uh, yes, Commissioner, we are. We definitely see some results, and it also gives us an avenue, an avenue to uh, to be able to discuss with the with the bank or the you know the lawful owners to utilize those property preservation companies um, to to help clear those properties and clean them up. Uh, we definitely are are utilizing it. Uh, several properties, hundreds of properties, are registered every year, and, and we are seeing a benefit from that. Thank you. Welcome, Commissioner. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving from this slide, we're gonna go in and kind of give you a quick snapshot of what some of the other municipalities and our partners are using throughout the county. St. Petersburg has a very robust program, very dynamic, and they've kind of spearheaded this foreclosure program. Um, you can see here they have a, they have a dedicated force to this. Uh, Largo uh, is a little bit more uh, middle of the road. They are in development right now, and they have actually had some very successful cases, and they're in their process of, of moving forward with a program similar to St. Pete, but they, they hold a lot of that within their code enforcement division, and they also utilize some outside resources to accomplish that goal. Here in Pinellas County, ours is obviously in the very early stages. Um, we, we have a lien payment and or foreclosure program. We are in the process of working with the county attorneys. I said earlier we have several on deck that we're moving forward with. Um, I believe we have three that are in the process now, and we will likely see some success from that. Uh, but what this slide demonstrates uh, is that we, we really could utilize um, some insight, some, some policy direction, and get your take on where we want to be. If we want to be similar to St. Pete and have a very dynamic and built out program, or if we want to continue the operation that we're doing now, or something along the lines of Largo, for example, uh, that way we can, we can work with county administration to really step up this program and move forward. And I think commissioners, so for instance, I forget the gentleman's name, but we, you know, Commissioner Gerard asked that, you know, we meet with him and what, what the biggest difference that they do is early in the process when we're trying to work through the uh, magistrate um, and try to gain compliance, 
they initiate foreclosure. <laughs> okay, so they, so they 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 cut that time period down, and and they go right you know to that. And that's probably the biggest difference. I mean, I'm not speaking for Commissioner Jard, but uh, that I heard between our program and that. And so it's you know I, I'm sure you. It, if we initi if we get more aggressive, well, then there's going to be some benefits to that. There's also going to be some pushback and some negative uh, consequences of how we work with our residents. And so, you know, I, I think it's on balance, and that's what we're we're trying to deal with. And I think that highlight, if you hear the other two programs, I think we're pretty much similar to most of the other programs around the county. Largo and St. Pete, I think, are the two um, outliers on that. They have a more robust program and they look at it a little bit differently. And in particular, those two outsource that piece of it, which is to initiate that legal action earlier in that process. And, but there's been some problems with that too. They've initiated things that they didn't have a right to initiate on. And um, you know, especially when the property was changing hands and stuff. So there's some downsides to that. But I just maybe to help clarify some of the differences in, in that pro in, in between our different programs. Yep, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We kind of had like the, the, the carrot stick and incentive kind of when we started this uh, a while back of part of the carrot was we, re we got ridic um, rid of the ridiculous liens. I mean, we were never going to collect $3 million on a $50,000 house kind of thing. We got rid of those. Um, but that, that we would go after, we would find like the one poster child, the worst one, and we would drop the hammer on the worst one hoping that that would kind of message would spread through the community for some of these guys that own multiple properties that, you know, put the minimum in. Um, I mean, I don't want to use the term slumlord, but, fits. you know, and so I guess my question is, have we gotten to the point of, of dropping the hammer on some of the worst ones? You talk about we have three. Is that where we're at with those three? And, and are they rentals? Are they out of state owners kind of thing? What, what's the situation there? Well, two of them are residential properties. One of them is actually a commercial property, which is an abandoned club on 19. Um, so they, they, to your point, they, they are some of the worst, um, but they're also some of the most eligible. And we, of course, want to start with those ones that have the least amount of concerns around them that will allow us to be successful. Um, some of the other properties you're talking about, you know, essentially dropping the hammer through the injunctive process with uh, the county, with, in conjunction with the county attorney's office. Uh, we've been very successful on a couple of these other properties that have been your, your real severe issues. Something to keep in mind is most of those are um, homestead, so we can't take them to a foreclosure process. So the only option is injunction, um, and even there. We, we tend to have some limitations. It's up to the judge on how far the judge wants to take it to compel compliance, which could, in some cases, lead all the way to the, the arrest. But that's not for our violation. That's for the viol That's for essentially not doing what the judge said. It's not to follow the order. But we haven't had to do that yet with any of these cases. What we've done is we've simply gone in and cleared the cases. We or cleared the properties. We've gotten permission from the from the judge to go onto the private property, which is homesteaded, and clean it up. Uh, we had one recently where we removed about seven vehicles from the front lawn of the property, as well as a lot of trash and debris. Um, and we've had a couple of others that have been very successful. Um, bearing in mind the difference between the homestead and non-homestead is really where the challenge comes in. Those ones that you saw in the injunctive process, those are mostly homesteaded properties, and we don't really have another avenue. So the courts have been very, very kind to us in, in helping us out and getting through that process. And of course, with the support of the county attorney, we've seen a lot more successes than we ever had before. Uh, prior to 2021, I, I don't believe the division had done an injunction to the degree that we are now. Um, so we are certainly doing quite a bit more than we ever had before. It seemed that in prior discussions that we had that, um, and again, I'm thinking about Lelman, that a huge portion, uh, a disproportionate number was rental properties in the area. And, and uh, obviously economics have changed over the last several years for rental properties, but it was the out of state or out of area owner who just wasn't, you know, keeping things up to code. And 
Correct. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, kind of absentee owners or abandoned properties that we were working with, um, with the assistance of county administration. We started to tackle those abandoned properties a, a little more aggressively, um, and we, we we've seen a lot of success there. We've had a couple of demolitions, one of which we had to in state. Not a, only a few weeks ago, we completed a demolition with the help of the county attorney's office. It was an emergency demolition on a very problematic and unsafe property, and we were successful there. So we are starting to see a lot of turnaround. Um, at a, clearly a much higher rate than previous years because we were just weren't doing it before and now we are. So in a few years, we'll certainly have better data. Uh, but right now we have 20 properties and 14 cases in litigation in this process. And then on the, the carrot side, I guess, when we come to a, and have a violation and it's, um, are, we, are we sharing information with the homeowner about nonprofits in the community that can assist them with making those repairs or Absolutely, especially uh, you know, the Lillman community, for example, we get a lot of traction in there. And we, we work with the Florida Dream Center, uh, Keeping Alls Beautiful, and other programs to try to help some of these folks out the best we can. Um, and in some cases, we have to perform lot clearings on them because they just don't have the means to do it. Now, those fees, of course, are tacked on in, in the form of a lien, and at some point, that you know, through the property sale, it will, they will likely have to pay back the county for that. But we try to do our best to work with those folks that don't have the means to do so. Uh, again, particularly in the south part of the county. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Gerard. Yes, I have a question. Um, on your slide 16, it looks like 75% of these where you have a lien is not homesteaded or not in foreclosure. So that's quite a number. It's yeah. kind of appalling to me that it takes four years to get, to get an injunction. That is amazing. You know, well, and I think about the house down the street from me that's been condemned for four years at least. And I don't know that there's any action going on that, but uh, I would like to see us be a bit more aggressive. And I just to mention the thing in Largo, um, you asked about help for the homeowner, that angel fund that they put the, the money that they gain from the process into the angel fund to help people who can't do it by themselves um, and need some help to, to get their property in order. So I think that's a pretty cool program myself. And I know in St. Pete that they're doing, when they take a property, it, it's either going to um, rehab that property, given to a, a nonprofit to rehab that property or given to Habitat to rebuild. So. You know, I think in the in the situation where it's not a homestead, we should be being a bit more aggressive than we are. You know, as much as the law allows, but obviously other other areas are doing it. You know, and it is it's not fair to the to the neighborhood when somebody when it goes on for years and years and the property is just mm -hmm. sitting there or getting worse by the year. I, you know. And hope, you know, hopefully you're not trying to sell your house in that time frame. You know, yeah, so you have, a, you have that issue. I think that's the, you know, you think about these individual homes that just, that they're just a blight to a neighborhood that had take forever for all the reasons, you know, that we try to protect the other houses that have that, you know, we're just trying to get compliance. I think that's, that's the system that I like, that we're trying to get compliance. At the end of the day, we're not trying to be heavy handed just get it done. I'm glad to hear about the 77% number. That's, that's great. And I think that would be like a target to try to keep, you know, and I know you are. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's just those one or two homes that I, I remember getting a few calls to people's and they say, look at this, it's been this way for two years, you know, and I'm like, you're kidding. And you find out that it's just part of a process that's just so painful uh, to the neighbors in that neighborhood. Um, yeah, so how we can be selectively using the hammer versus being, I don't know, but uh, I know Jewel had a couple of comments. Yeah, one thing I would add is that the, the time frame for enforcement once these things reach circuit court, you know, whatever the, the vehicle may be, it varies. And I'm going to guess that that four year is in regard to a pretty egregious case, um, one that I could recall in not too distant memory. And, you know, forgive me, I can't think of the name of the restaurant that I know a lot of you were familiar with that was out on Gandhi 
that we dealt with that had the unpermitted structure with plumbing and sewer and electricity out over the water that was a huge violation of our codes, you know, that's one that I can think of that did take quite a while. And that owner threw up just about every roadblock they could, including filing bankrupt, oh, I'm told, I see sharks. <laughs> um, they filed bankruptcy, they tried to get a stay from the federal court, they got involved personally, they had corporations, they changed hands. I mean, they really did just about everything they could to avoid compliance. So those are your four-year cases. You already heard Jude refer to a case that we recently demolished. Um, that's a case that only recently came to you all for approval. And in fact, um, that's a case that also had some animal issues. And I spoke with the chair under our policy to get advance um, authorization to file that suit. And so by the time it came to you all to ratify that action, we were nearly ready to get that house demolished. So that was a very quick. So it's a real range. So I don't want you all to think that four years is what it always takes. I mean, in that case, and I'm guessing that might be the one that, that is a reference to the four years, there were some substantial roadblocks um, thrown up there. So, you know, there's, there's variations here, but we also have some really good examples where things were accomplished in a very brief period of time. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of throw that out there. And just as a follow on, Jude and the county attorney's office have worked closely together over the last couple of years to try to find ways to speed these up. And so that is kind of a more recent thing, but they've kind of refined that process to try to, again, get, get the compliance, but if you s clearly see they're not gonna get compliance to elevate it and elevate it quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and just to speak to that very recently, uh, the county attorney's office helped us acquire a, uh, a warrant for a property that had been ongoing over uh, on 108th that was uh, very problematic. Um, that was executed just last week. Uh, we found several uh, household conditions that, were, that made the home inhabitable. Um, and we're already moving forward with the process to clean that property. And it's been ongoing for quite a while. This, the posting for the uh, lot clearing was done a couple of days ago. Uh, so we're actually, I apologize, yesterday. And uh, we'll be moving forward and getting that cleaned up probably in the next 10 days or so. So some of this stuff is happening very quickly. And to Jules' point earlier, the, the property that we demolished, we, from the point of discovery to the point of demolition, was in the vicinity of about two weeks. Um, which is very quick. And, and we are taking on a lot more responsibilities and a lot more duties. So even though we had reduced our time for, timelines for response time, this was in addition to a lot more add-ons of, of stuff that we started to do. We're removing uh, junk vehicles now from yards. Um, again, we're doing the lot clearings. We, we had a very, very successful warrant. We have had a couple of properties, that we, one that I can recall that we did pass on to Habitat for Humanity, where they demolished it and took care of it, and that was a couple, about two years ago, very successful. And we are seeing things happening, happening very, very quickly. On this timeline um, that I put back up here, it, it shows how much it can be. Um, you know, it can be up to 1,400 days. So it kind of shows that, you know, it, it depends on at, at what point of compliance we achieve. Um, Icy Sharks was a, an excellent example of something that could take a very long time. Uh, we've had some that, that are averaging right now about 12 months, uh, which is fairly significant. Um, and and we're, we're working very diligently to reduce that, that time frame. Um, it's it's the, the foreclosure process that we don't have a, a total handle on yet, but we are certainly learning as we go. We are working very closely with the county attorney, and I think that we're going to see a lot of success from that, and I think that we're going to see these timelines, you know, ultimately reduce as we move forward with that. Uh, Commissioner Justice said earlier, you know, if we kind of set the example and set the bar, we'll probably start to see people follow suit, and I think that's going to happen. Um, so is there a, is there a way to have these homes that are being looked at, they're in the, they're in the queue system, they're past the 77% that comply. Um, is there a way to have information that, that residents could, you know, if they call uh, and get like, okay, this property and just see if it's even in the process of, you know, like, or do they, is there a, 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 a system online to do that? Or they just have to call in and, or call our offices and, call you and then get, you know, it's a kind of a cumbersome 
It is. Uh, th there is, on the Acela system, there is a way to do that. It's currently under construction right now, okay. so there, there will be a way to view that. They had to make some modifications based on the information that was and wasn't available. Right now, though, people do call in on a very, very regular basis. You can see earlier we get 20,000 calls yeah. a year, but only 5,000 of those are, are uh, cases. So the other 15,000 of those end up typically being informational to things such as uh, lien searches as well as statuses on cases. Um, part of the kind of the reverse benefit, if you will, the, is when we put stuff online, some folks don't totally understand the information and or what that yeah. phase means. We see very similar issues with C-Click-Fix. It says that a case is closed. Well, it's not closed. It's just been moved to the next segment. We've closed the complaint, but the case is still very active. So we're trying to work through that process to make sure that we're giving correct information to citizens. It's easy to follow. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? One other thing I'll just add that to kind of gets to the 1400 day issue there, or at least the lengthier processes is that, you know, you've already heard you say it's a very small percentage of cases that are really the problem cases. Um, you know, and one of the, the hurdles that we see in trying to address this as we move forward and try to get injunctions are the cases where you just can't figure out who the owner is because the title is held by a person who's deceased, for example. Um, and to get the case properly filed and to get a proper party served, you know, you some often have to do an air search. You know, you might have to hire a you know, private investigator to figure out who these folks are. So again, we've been working with Jude and his staff, my staff has, you know, to come up with some processes. So, you know, rather than get frustrated by the fact that we can't identify an owner and we can't move forward, that we come up with processes that, you know, um, kind of create a path forward for us so that we can get these things done. But, you know, again, it's a very small percentage of properties, but I know that that is another issue that we've tangled with quite a bit is finding out who is that proper person to serve. Um, because that can also be a real impediment to, of course, getting compliance because if there's not a proper party there that's um, invested in managing and taking care of the property, that's what gets it to code enforcement in the first place. Um, and again, I see sharks, I'll fill in some more blanks. I'm also advised that part of the length of that process is that went through the appeals process too. So it was a, it was a lengthy one for, sure, for certain. Um. I don't see any other questions. Jude, I just want to thank you for the presentation, but also um, how responsive you always are in working with our office when we need when we have issues and questions and stuff. It's a, it's it's really good to be able to have that uh, that good feedback. So thank you um, for Absolutely. for that work. Um, thank yeah. you, Commissioner. If I can just add one yeah. other, you know, I stopped out the other day. I was uh, we were out looking at different properties and ran across a code enforcement officer, you know, that was writing up his cases and. What I was really impressed with is, is kind of this understanding of the community and really getting to know the community and the nonprofits and people there um, to where they can be a value add to help, you know, improve the community. They were excited that we were going to build a community park. We were out in the High Point area and, and just kind of that sharing of information. They work with law enforcement. They work with um, all of our other departments to, you know, the, to be part of the solution for the community. And so. Um, I found that there. I found the, the same with the officers down in Loman and many others. So um, they're they're really trying to work, you know, with as, as a community issue rather than just an enforcement case. It's it's much bigger than that. And um, so I just really do appreciate their efforts. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, the community police officer concept was so refreshing to get. So having a community sort of approach or sensitivity or whatever, it's just, it's just obviously the way to go, so. Okay, thank any you. other comments, questions? Thank you, Jude, appreciate thank, it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on to number three, American Rescue Plan Act update. That, okay, little, so that little thing. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so Kevin and uh, Laura are here, um, they, you know, they, we've been able to talk to five of seven of you. We still have to follow up with two individually. Um, we have your comments, um, uh, your individual comments, and you know, it, as you can expect, you know, one commissioner says uh, we should do more of this, and the other commissioners we shouldn't be spending money on that. So you know, we've got a lot of different ideas that we're going to have to kind of work through to bring back some recommendations uh, for you. Um, but, I, but we do want to follow up with uh, other two commissioners individually. But we wanted to put this on because we're going to 
we're going to bring back to you some recommendations based upon all your feedback here in January. And so we wanted to at least put this on to see if there's any um, discussions you wanted to have as a commission. Um, if you don't, that's fine. But if there's anything you want to discuss here today, we certainly are open to that because, again, at the end of the day, we're going to uh, have to kind of synthesize all this information down and bring back some strategies and information. This will not, this will be a beginning of a process, not the end of that process. So we'll be bringing back some initial recommendations. We will then have ongoing discussions. We can navigate and change. We're not going to be uh, recommending programming all the funds, just really that first year. Um, and so we'll have other opportunities as we go along. But anyway, um, we just want to put it on since we're going to be bringing it back to see if there's any discussions based upon the feedback that we've received so far. Well, I, I would just say yesterday my, my meeting was really short because I said, you know, just even this document of six pages of projects, um, there's no real quick way to scan them. You, you really have to go through them and try to understand um, the significance of each. And, of course, I don't understand all the significances of some of them, and some of them make a lot of sense to me. And um, uh, there's an awful lot here. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, and, and then trying to think of other things, um, you know, that are we considering those, we had those kind of conversations before, you know, major projects that, you know, that would be a different approach than spreading them out type thing Correct. That, we're, that we're talking about here. Um, but I, I just don't, I, you know, I guess it's types of projects and, you know, that that's a big, if we can agree on stuff like that and then we can dive into some of these things and get them going because we, as you say, we have to, we have to do it within a certain period of time. And we have to do it within a certain period of time. We also, um, I'm very leery of doing anything that has legacy cost. Um, obviously yeah. that has future budgetary impacts. Um, I know there's needs out there and, and, and I understand that. I think we need to address it through, through traditional manner, uh, not through one-time funding type sources like this. Um, and so those will be, you know, some of my recommendations still, a even though I know that there's, you know, community members that are requesting those types of programs. And I think that we want to work on those issues with them. I just not, don't necessarily think these are the funds that, that are necessarily the, the way in which to address some of those larger community concerns. Yeah, the, uh, and the very second one on here was, seemed to be one of those, pro not that I'm against the project, but it seemed to be one of those legacy type projects, and that was the uh, 11 new positions at the Sheriff's Department for the uh, mental health and behavioral health policy, uh, you know, policy. Again, now, it's on, just a... But on that one, okay, so what we were using is we're, we have budgeted for those. Um, and so we're, we're standing up the program, but we have budgeted on ongoing cost that program so it doesn't create a legacy cost that's unfunded. We're just using these funds that are eligible to help offset the cost to where um, in that way then we maintain that going forward. And so what we're using is, let's say we're putting a million dollars a year, I forget the numbers, but a million dollars a year into the program. Well, we've budgeted the million dollars, but for the three years that, that's eligible to be reimbursed off of these funds, we're taking that $3 million and putting that into capital, additional one-time cost. Okay. And okay. so it's a way of offsetting that, but it's a fully budgeted cost. And, it, and we can do that because it's internal. It's much harder to do that if it's external agencies or things like that. Yeah, and the other thing I was asking was uh, uh, getting another category here that, or another, um, yeah, category basically that kind of says, where are we relieving other funds from? So some of this stuff is, uh, you know, penny relief. Mm -hmm. And so it, the, all these pieces and all these funds kind of fit together in a nice puzzle. And for, you know, for me, it gets rather puzzling when I don't know what all those trade-offs are. So we are doing some things in here that I know you, you're Correct. basically pulling out of the penny. It's about and you 30, might be pulling about, out of other things. So About $33 million worth yeah. of um, what would have been penny-funded projects. Um, so we're trying to create a balance on that. Um, we're trying to give her a little relief for the penny because we know we're going to have choices to make on from the penny projects. Um, the, the penny is, is overcommitted by $100 million um, over that 10-year period. Um, and that's before we get into design of some of the projects. And I guarantee the designs are gonna come in more than what the estimate's on based upon everything that's happened in the construction field. So we were trying to give it a little relief and at the same time not spend all the money 
on you know things like that and actually do some community good like the sidewalk program the the safe routes to schools and things that we'll never get to if we don't use these one-time monies for that so we're trying to it, it really is a balance there's no right or wrong answer and that's the reason I think getting everybody's input is important and if we started to get a feel for yet of that uh, 1.5 trillion dollar infrastructure budget that was passed what types of things are, are going to trickle down to communities um, because it'd be nice to know if we have another pot coming for those kinds of right. things uh, how that offsets with this pro program I, I, we're gonna, it's going to take us it's going to take a, a while to be able to get we know that you know infrastructure including roads bridges things like that wastewater systems how much and in what manner we won't know for some time um, you know, and I just met with the, Hill, the county administrators in Hillsborough and Pasco. They were asking the same things. Have you heard anything? How are, so we're all in that together, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of professional through, you know, make, through uh, county engineers and things like that, uh, really looking at, at, as the rules come out, the way in which the money will be distributed. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg said that it's going to be through existing programs. Um, so we're going to have to watch that. As, but, but what that also tells us is that over this next year, while we're implementing this first round, then we'll have better information as we finalize plans for the second round. Um, and so we, we don't want to commit all of it. We want to see what, uh, to where we can maximize uh, the federal funds. And so, uh, you know, only using portions of these until we have better clarity on the infrastructure bill makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think you mentioned, I think Commissioner Gerard was asking about some of the uh, uh, manufactured home communities or that, and there's, there's a, it looks like a $25 million number being proposed for uh, Restore Act wastewater collection system improvements. Mm -hmm. um, to, to one of those major issues that we're dealing with that we talked about. Um, we do, and so that gives, we've set aside money. We, you know, some of these areas, we have to do the initial um, investigation to understand really what the cost. So we've set aside a number based upon our best guess, um, but we'll have to refine that as we do the investigation. Um, but it at least provides funds to where we can address some of these areas we that have remained um, unaddressed for years. And in some of these private wastewater systems and stuff, that's part of it. Um, and so, uh, there, because that goes back to the manufactured home strategy. It's, it's a far bigger issue than just a wastewater issue. It's about cleaning up some of these communities and having them, you know, um, be at, at a maintenance repair. And, and so that requires a much broader strategy than just the sewer piece. Yeah. Commissioner Seal, we're, we're just kind of chatting here a little bit. So I know you wanted to weigh in. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I too went over the list um, in a phone call yesterday or the day before rather, and um, they were gonna give us a list of the manufactured homes that are being considered for that wastewater collection program. Um, so that should be forthcoming. Uh, the other thought I had was the, and I didn't mention this, it just, it, it just occurred to me yesterday, if, we have some additional land that we wish to buy for preservation reasons. Um, that might be another use of this funding. It would be a one-time basis. Um, obviously, when we put together our priority list for lands that we wanted to acquire, um, they were a lot more than what we had in the penny. So I just wanted to put that forward as an idea. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, um, and again, I guess some of those groups are set up, and they've set themselves up almost as a 501c3. Um, um, and, and we've talked, there's a, I guess when we discussed yesterday, and, and you all that called and had me on the line for about 10 minutes, I, I did go through the whole list last night so that I at least had a better understanding on some of the things, but you know, um, anything, anything? Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Um, I, I believe my memory serves me correct. I couldn't find my notes. The proposed or conversation regarding a build out of a potential office space slash concession stand um, up in, I think, East Lake? Probably. Yeah. That was from the penny. It, it and is. It, it was getting pushed back, you know, well, 
it was supposed to be from the pen, but you know, other things were becoming. Is that something that will move up on the list as a result of some of the moving around the funds or? Well, that has to be looked at as part of the penny um, evaluation process. Um, so it's, it's not on the ARPA list, but it is in our penny funds. And remember, part, part of when, we, when they created the penny in 2017, they had ideas. And now we're going back and meeting with each one of those, especially um, both internally and externally, refining what that estimate is and then um, trying to rank that within the program penny dollars. So that's, it is on our list. Um, it is um, a, it, it isn't funded yet, um, but that doesn't mean it won't be funded. It just means that we're trying to evaluate how much money we have and, and where we, what all the needs are. Do we know how long it's been on the list? And I guess the reason I'm asking this is because if, if we have cost estimates for projects, which is more than what we have in the penny, I'm just trying to wrap my head around how that happened. Because if you're looking at how, first of all, I know you do estimations on what the penny is supposed to bring in. Correct. And then the, and then the penny brings in whatever, based on forecasting earlier, it brings in whatever. So we had some, probably some times when the penny didn't bring in as much as maybe was thought or perceived. That may have been before you and I, I don't, I don't know. But um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around what projects um, I, that were approved and we had already spent <coughs> the max amount of penny that we had. Um, and then I believe you all did the ranking of projects, right? You know, based on input from the community. So that's how you determine that wasn't it? Well, they did. Up Maybe I'm confusing the two where you, you, you rank yes. projects. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get a clarification on, on that and how it works. So on the penny, you, you developed a list of community projects and you also developed a list of internal infrastructure that you wanted to maintain that we use for the penny. Unfortunately, the same things happened two decades in a row where the, at the last decade you initiated the penny and then 2000, that was 2010, 11, the downturn in the economy. And so it ended up bringing in less. Okay. You did estimates based upon this penny. You passed that in 2017 um, it, and then we had the pandemic hit. And so we revised our estimates down and then this year we boosted them back up because we see the economy improving. And so we're constantly revising our estimates on what that's bringing in. Um, and now we have to factor in that construction cost for a lot of our projects are gonna come in higher because of the market right now. That's the constant ongoing. So we, we program out um, of about three year, or about five years. We lock in about three years. And so we're doing some of those preliminary cost estimates. And as those, those programs come in and we have refined costs, then it allows us to program out the next couple of years. Okay. The project you mentioned is on the list, um, along with Palm Harbor Community Center and, and a number of community projects. But remember, that same penny is used for our, you know, waste, or for our um, um, stormwater systems, our roads, our site, you know. So it, it's used for a number of different internal infrastructure issues that maybe not, aren't as this, the community doesn't necessarily see. Um, but that's, it's all used at, for the variety of sources. We have a, um, an internal staff team where they take all of the projects in um, and they, they use that and rank that and categorize those. And then that's ultimately what comes to you as part of the budget process as a recommendation. Okay, that's what I yeah. was trying to, and, to do. And, and we have like six pages for this, but I, I, I hesitate to not see the number of pages we'd have for our penny. Uh, projects that were identified by our creative staff, not only creative, but, you know, good staff yep. that uh, comes up with these projects. And again, talk about drinking from a fire hose. I mean, those, the, you know, we approve a year at a time in that, in that penny. Uh, but we start, we certainly want to keep track of that stuff because, yeah. Gosh, this thing and, does move around, and, 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 and remember that it only the money only started coming in for 2020. <laughs> that's the that's the first year. This the first thing we needed to do um, was to get some preliminary engineering on some of these projects. Um, I, I I don't want to speculate on how some of those numbers were arrived at, but um, but 
I need preliminary engineering to be able to set a budget, you know, not a swag. Um, and some of the projects are in various stages of refinement uh, about where that number come from. So as we get some of that preliminary engineering done, which was what you approved this last year in the budget, so instead of $3 million for a project, we, we, we get, you know, we budgeted 300000 to where they can give a preliminary estimate and programming. And now then we can take that to say, yeah, it's $3 million, or no, it's $4 million, or $2 million. And, and then that becomes the programming budget that will be used in future years. So we're just getting that 10-year that period off and running, um, and you'll see better refinement over this next year and in future years. Yeah, yeah that, that pennies, um, um, you know, we, we look at what we've done with it, and then we put a program forward for our residents to vote on. Um, and we try to try to accommodate some, and we had some s spillover from the last penny that we're we still looking at. Um, and then, you know, in 2015, 16, and 17, we'll start developing the new thing, looking at the decade ahead. I mean, certainly 25. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it, I mean, it, it, it just it, it's an ongoing thing. I can see a lot more classic infrastructure. Yeah. in that next penny. that and We do have a lot of it in this penny, too, but we, but we do have other stuff in there, too, that the residents really liked and wanted and voted for. But And you know. if you think about, uh, I'll give you a, a huge one, is like the widening of East Lake Road. Now, mm -hmm. is that, are you going to do intersections or are you going to widen that entire road? Well, well, that's a big difference <laughs> in the amount of money that it takes to fund that project, depending upon what comes out of all the community meetings and the um, um, the preferred alternates for that project. And so you have to get through some of these initial uh, engineering pieces before we can refine the budget to know what is available then for lower priority projects. Yeah. And it, it continues to iterate. <laughs> you get that community, you do the estimate, then you go back to the community to show them what it is, and then they get more more feedback. So That's correct. Um, yeah, it's a cumbersome process. But I do, I, I think it's important that at least uh, if we can get this list where to, to, and have a, a corresponding fund that says where we're getting some relief from it, it would okay. be... It would be helpful uh, for, for me. Um, and then maybe just as, as we try to get a clear understanding on that $1.5 trillion infrastructure, what kinds of things we can use that for? I mean, not anything like how much, but just, I don't, you know, yeah. as compared to what this can be used for. And because and I, was, I was glad to see that we did get, um, you know, a, a stormwater expansion in Palm Harbor. I was looking for something um, up there. <laughs> um, I'm glad to see that, you know, at least the stormwater piece got it. But I'd, I'd just like to see how it offsets other yeah. budget stuff. So, And there is there is a balance with that because we also have to recognize that there's uh, there's rules around how we can spend the funds. Yeah. And yeah. and so we have to, you know, we're, we're challenged a little bit in that. But just because out of this funds, these funds that we we spend money in one area. What that also does, though, is frees up money that we would have uh, spent on the penny to where we can do projects in other areas. Yeah. So they do work in conjunction with yeah. each other. And that's, other. I think, it will be helpful to, to know that that connection. So yeah. any, uh, uh, did you have something, Commissioner yes, sir. Justice? First off, uh, what is that Palm Harbor project? Because I think it meant to say Lelman. <laughs> yeah, you want to try, you want to, it doubted Lelman, <laughs> I know. Um, I did want to, um, and I can, we can do it manually, but if the staff has ability to, to group these geographically, I think if, if you can easily move the chart around, mm -hmm. that would be, because we were talking yesterday about how we've, with our, our roads and our projects, we've gone to a portfolio approach to where we go into one area, and, and I don't know what the timeline on these different, if we did every one of these, you know, if we're going to do the 46th Avenue project in 2022, but then this project in 2024, would it make sense to group them geographically to where we're, and I don't, you know, obviously it depends on the work we're doing and all that, but to where we're making a huge impact in Dansville in 2022 and a huge impact in Lelman in 2023 and in the, whatever we're doing in Palm Harbor in 2026. Um, but those, is it, does that make sense to group it geographically? I mean, I think some of the projects have synergies to them. You know, certainly down in the Lelman area, the idea of of addressing uh, the um, the trail and the stormwater 
um, really ties into your community vision um, and and gets some of the private investment and stuff going. So I think there's there's opportunities like that certainly. Um, but the, some of the other programs, like the, the um, safe routes to schools, um, it's kind of sporadic, dependent upon just how development occurred. Um, but I'm just thinking that if, if we tie this in, like the 46th Avenue, the drainage, the stormwater that we're talking about, along with our current plans for the penny for the Neary Park and those things, in a short period of time, uh, a community um, which is more eligible for some of these projects yep. than others, would see a dramatic mm -hmm. improvement in the quality of life. And I think that is beyond the actual value of each individual little project. I think the culmination of all of those together has huge community benefit. And, um, and so I think there's some value there. I don't know we can, all we the can, budgetary parts of it, but. We can put some of that together, but you're right. I mean, you, you're seeing a lot of investment in hype, and it's not just the capital projects. It's tying in with some of the other things that we've presented for you. Um, you know, in the last several months, but in High Point, in Ridgecrest, in um, in Melman, you know, those those are, are are significant. But some of those, some of the projects are also um, um, w would have been penny funds that then frees up penny funds to be able to do other projects in other areas that otherwise we may not been able to do with the penny. So it does tie together. It's just really hard to tie it all together because it's just so large of a capital project. I, yeah, and, and I understand that it's not as simple as I'm making it, but I think there's just there's enough benefit to that that it's worth taking a look at to see if the calendar can, you know, there's, uh, as you said, synergy, if there's some magic to the calendar um, to do it. I, I just think, one, it's overdue. Two, it's things that we've promised these communities. Three, it's the goal of ARPA when they talk about the communities have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. Um, so I think I think there's a lot. I think there is value there. I don't know okay. at the end of the day what that is, but I do think there's community value there. Uh, the second question I had was about the portion that staff has recommended set aside for nonprofits. Um, if you all have thought more about fleshing that out, or um, and I told staff when I met with them yesterday that my thought was a a smaller number of large investments in nonprofits rather than a million different nonprofits getting a dollar kind of yeah. thing. Um, so I've, I, I just read the comments. I, I received those last night, the same as you, or, you know, the, the kind of a summary from what all the commissioners said, and there's some different ideas uh, regarding that. We haven't met as a staff to talk through that. We were trying to get commissioner feedback. One of the things we did talk about is maybe we should divide up that 19 million into like two tranches, you know, and do like, you know, $10 million the first time or something. And let's see what kind of projects we have. Um, to where there's significant, you know, it's not, you know, uh, improve the sidewalk up to, you know, this nonprofit, but it actually does something that makes a, you know, sizable impact. I, we haven't talked through that. We're, we're open to different ideas that you have, and, and we can certainly refine it based upon your feedback. I think it's, I think uh, there's merit there. I think, one, some of these nonprofits have been hit hard. Now, some of them have gotten funding from other sources that, you know, have stabilized them, but, um, uh, I think, one, you have the benefit of a bigger bang for your buck, you know. If everyone gets a dollar, it's not the same benefit if someone gets, you know, a yeah. million dollars. Yeah. It also is about staff for, for accountability and tracking that you're not tracking 5,000 small grant programs. I 100% uh, agree with that. <laughs> Commissioner Gerard. Well, I disagree. <laughs> my my uh, input was to put it out to the nonprofits for one thing and say what is it you need money for I think 19 million dollars is a lot um, even 10 million dollars in the first year is a lot um, because I wouldn't want this money to pay for things that CDBG can pay for you know construction projects things like that um, I just think the money is there and sometimes they don't even have enough applications to spend all the CDBG money. And usually those things are spread out over a few years because it takes forever to build anything. Um, and I think five, five or ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars can make a big difference to a nonprofit. You know, for the kinds of things that they can't buy in their regular budget, technology and, you know, equipment. We mentioned freezers and things like that. I think, you know, I'm not, you know, under Five or ten thousand dollars? No, I wouldn't do that. But 
you know, for capital items that just won't be covered anywhere else, that's pretty important. It's pretty hard to get for a nonprofit. Just saying. Yeah. It is a, it is a management process for sure because we yeah. you, 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 you you're going to get a lot a lot of people doing a lot of things and they're going to be all over the place but mm -hmm. I mean really you, you're right though commissioner you, you, you you've got to find out what's needed out there I mean we really we, we really you know we don't know you can talk to different different ones that do the same thing and yeah and and also I mean something that we didn't talk about was because we're starting to get inquiries from a variety of types of nonprofits. Sure. And if, if we are going to talk about, is this making up for any lost revenue during the pandemic, mm -hmm. or is this about, you know, a different type of need that came from the pandemic or, or current and existing community needs? So, you know, um, a, a, a group that does food pantries and economic development and job training versus an expansion of a cultural institution. Well, and I think that, to the programming piece, think through that and then provide us your feedback. I will tell you, we're focused around capital um, and one-time cost. If we have to try to audit and try to get to lost revenue and things like that, I think that's a, um, that's a nightmare um, in terms of from a management standpoint. And so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I, I welcome everybody's feedback on different you know, uh, ideas and the things that you're hearing from the community, because you're hearing probably a lot more than we will. So um, you know, as you do that, send that to us. We'll bring back, you know, a recommendation here in January, and, you know, we can go from there. We'll send that out in advance. But I know it's been a lot to take in. There's, a, you know, and I'm sure you have a lot of ideas. So, yeah, Commissioner Flowers. Some entities, though, um, nonprofits are receiving their own separate pots of funds to do just what Correct. that is, which is whatever their revenue may have been um, as a loss during that time period. Mm -hmm or what have you, they're receiving those dollars. I serve on the board for our club, and we, our club mm -hmm. is receiving a certain number of dollars that they're infusing, um, one time hit only, but they're infusing. So, um, you know, I, 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 want, I would love to see us speed up some of our infrastructure projects um, to get them not only going, but get them completed if we can. Yeah. And then those dollars that we generate um, from uh, the revenue that we receive annually, we can then reappropriate in other areas and work on that. But I also understand the comments we're getting from the community. These dollars are brought to the community, and we would not otherwise have these dollars had it not been for yep. what all has occurred. So it's a really, it's a, it's a really tricky thing. And then it's well, why they get money, and I, <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and the other thing is we have to stick to the categories. There are right. five categories. Yeah. Um, for funding, and so whatever the ask may be, they have to fit within those categories, yeah. or we'd be in trouble. And when I was at the legislative uh, conference for the Florida Association of Counties, one of the things people kept asking was, do I have to have that money spent in four years, or is it that I have at least have to have that project coming out of the ground? If I'm not mistaken, what it was was you've got to significantly have that project coming out of the ground, but then you have to have it completed within, I think, two years after that. So mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. got to be quick. Yeah. You know, it's got to be something that yeah. can happen pretty quickly, so. Yeah. To, yeah. And to your point, what you just said, though, about uh, one of the pieces that we did recommend is kind of a community navigator helping nonprofits link up to other federal funds, because dependent upon the sophistication of the nonprofit or the, whether they have grant people or not, um, they they may not know and uh, about opportunities to kind of replace some of those funds. So. I think that is a, a really good piece that we can do t is to link to a lot of other money that's out there that they just may not know not, know about. So. Yeah, uh, I think you, you, the point you brought up I think is a is a good one, and I know you guys are thinking this way too. But I, 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 whether it's ca called low hanging fruit or whatever, that we all kind of agree on some of these sidewalk projects and some of these communities that we wouldn't have gotten to, but really are important from a public safety standpoint mm -hmm. and all of that. It's an infrastructure piece, it's um, huge. and we are out there doing sidewalk stuff. You know, trying mm -hmm. to fix up some of these problem areas. I, again, I I think we can start okay. getting some of these commitments, even if we don't get it all at one time. Um, we can uh, probably agree on some of it. Um, I think what we'll do. It's it's I, twelve oh five. Lunch is here, um, so uh, let's break until say quarter to one. Uh, give us about thirty forty minutes. Um, 
after lunch, we'll have redistricting term limits in the agenda briefing. Um, so that shouldn't take too long. <laughs> I'll see. We'll see you back here at quarter to 1245. Thanks.
We're going to go first to the redistricting update. Um, and I am assuming that, Kurt, you are with us. Kurt, Sp Kurt Spitzer. Online. Uh, okay, great. Oh, there you are. We wanted to make sure we saw your smiling face uh, on the screen. So um, good to have you with us. And I think I'll just turn it over to you to kind of guide us into this uh, conversation, our, really our second workshop on the item. So go ahead, Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the redistricting process this year was, uh, remember, a, a little bit compressed. Uh, the, the Bureau of the Census uh, delivered the data for redistricting of state and local governments almost five months late. We got it in mid-August. Um, your uh, redistricting board uh, met uh, several times. Uh, considered a total of 11 uh, proposals, 11 alternatives, some very minor, very technical in nature, uh, others more clearly policy changes. Uh, they delivered to you uh, four uh, proposals uh, back in early November, about a month ago now. Um, and uh, since that time, uh, I have talked with uh, almost every one of the of the county commissioners. Uh, uh, had a little online uh, uh, meeting with them, and uh, there are seven proposals in the memo that I delivered to you on November 29th. Uh, four of those are from the redistricting board, and then three are at the request of uh, a county commissioner. Uh, of those seven, I would characterize three as housekeeping or technical uh, in nature. Uh, then the other four are more of a policy uh, decision on the part of the legislative body of Pinellas County. And so if my plan here is just to quickly go through uh, the seven maps and uh, follow the order that's contained in the November 29th uh, memo. And so the first few maps will be maps that are technical or housekeeping in nature. And so you should be seeing my screen now with the redistricting software on it. The first two maps are uh, simply maps that uh, reflect boundary changes that are necessary because of changes by the Bureau of the Census to census block shapes that were on the edge or on the boundary line between one district and another. And so, uh, they're, these are very technical housekeeping kinds of changes. Here's an example of one block here. Uh, the, the reddish area and the bluish area are existing district boundaries, but it, as you can see, this block does not follow that shape any longer. And so in these cases where uh, most of the block in this case is in District 2, we have moved, we would recommend moving all of this block into District 2 in this fashion. And so you'll, you'll see that in, in, in the maps that you have in your packet. This is a recommendation from the redistricting board. This is a redistricting board proposal for uh, called current at-large districts with housekeeping adjustments. There were four such changes like this, and they're very, very minor changes. Here's another one here. Uh, in this area here, there's a, a block that follows a, a roadway, but there's nobody lives in this particular block, and so the, the recommendation is to draw this line like this. Uh, these are very minor technical changes um, that uh, we would recommend you Accept if, and if, and if you, you know, 
if you did not want to make these changes but keep the the shapes the work they were currently they are currently then we'd have to make some uh, our estimates as to how many people live in one part of a block and how many people live in another part of a block there were four uh, blocks that were split by the at-large uh, residence uh, areas and then there were two blocks that were split by the um, single member district areas. Here's one block right here. As you can see, it's these are very, very minor technical changes. There's only four houses here that are affected, but the problem is this is the block now that the, that the Bureau of the Census has. Why they made this change, I don't know. Um, but we need to, uh, you know, make adjustments to accommodate those types of changes. The other change, uh, this is reflected in RB Proposal 1, which was the single member district map, uh, is up in the northern tip of District 5. This is, again, the blue is the current boundary. The red is the current District 4 area. This block shape here uh, was changed, and uh, so we, the recommendation is to follow this particular block uh, boundary. If I can pull up the right proposal, here we go. Such as that. So these are, are truly, uh, in my mind, uh, technical housekeeping kinds of uh, changes. Then uh, the other. Hey, Kurt. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, Commissioner Justice had a question on on some of the early housekeeping adjustments. I think. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. No, I would just. It, I see that you're talking about specific map issues throughout all the different maps first, and I was just going to ask you if, when you talk about a particular map, if you would tell us which map it's labeled, so that I can grab the right map to look at. But I see that you're talking about the block census issues on all the different maps first. But I was just trying to make sure I had the right map in front of me as you're going through it. That's correct. The, the, the first map, uh, which concerned these uh, housekeeping changes with census blocks in at-large districts, was is called uh, RB Proposal 4. The second map that I was talking about concerned the uh, changes in district shapes due to changes in census block shapes uh, in single member districts. And this is uh, titled RB Proposal 1, uh, current single member districts with housekeeping adjustments. Okay. Anything else? Okay, go ahead, Kurt. Yes, sir. So then the, the next sort of uh, change, and this is a little bit less of a technical change, I would say, but still is a housekeeping change. You may remember that your charter uh, directs the redistricting board to consider when feasible, uh, not splitting municipal boundaries by uh, commission district boundaries. It's impossible to not split the city of St. Petersburg. It's impossible to not split the city of Clearwater. But there are um, uh, three other cities where uh, they are split in a very minor way. And you could make adjustments to those uh, boundaries within those areas so that the cities are not split. And this is RB proposal three dash single member uh, districts. And so let me pull this version up here. Here you can see the difference in the again the the, the, the shaded color behind everything is the existing districts boundaries. The black line is the proposal that 
would avoid splitting the cities. And there's some changes in uh, Seminole here and here. Uh, then there are changes in other uh, jurisdictions as well. Let me pull up a different map. It'll make it a little bit easier to see, I think. This, these are the cities here. And then this line is the existing district boundaries. And so this is the city of Seminole split here and here. This is Pinellas Park. And there are some splits here. And then this is Largo. And the, as you can see, there are some splits here. Now, let me uh, pull up a different screen, which perhaps will better illustrate this. These are the areas that are split here. And in most cases, it's uh, uh, the, the population changes are not uh, very significant. This area uh, in uh, the northern part of District 7 that uh, splits Pinellas Park, moving this area into District 6 is around 2,100 people or so. And then this area here in Seminole is about 1,000 people. The other, um, there's, there's 20 people in this part of Seminole. The other ones, there's no one that lives uh, up, up in this area. The, the other ones are fairly insignificant, but in terms of population. But uh, so this is the uh, recommendation that we have. Um, and let me get out of this uh, and pull this back up. So you should be seeing the map again, uh, the, the software again. Uh, this is the uh, current boundaries. And so the proposal is this, is the dark line here. And so it brings um, all of Largo into uh, District uh, 5. It brings all of Seminole into District 6, and it brings all of uh, Pinellas Park also into District 6. This could be considered to be a, a standalone option only, or uh, this policy of not splitting these cities uh, could be added or included uh, with any of the other three single member district alternatives that you have in your packet. And that's it's not now, but it could be. And that's and that's proposal three, right? That's correct. That's RB proposal three. Okay. Um, all of these all of these proposals um, in your uh, packet, uh, including, you know, doing nothing or, or perhaps just considering the, the technical changes due to changes in census block shapes, all of these proposals are well within uh, acceptable tolerances in terms of uh, redistricting criteria. Uh, they're, they're all, uh, in terms of population, they're all well within uh, the, the typical tolerance between the largest and the smallest district. Remember that the uh, a red flag is raised in the court system when the difference between the largest and the smallest district is 10 percentage points 
or greater. And there are exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, a spread of 10 percentage points or more raises a red flag. And so most of your plans that you have in front of you now show deviations of three points, maybe a little bit more. Um, this plan here uh, does, you know, remove some additional population primarily into District 6. This has a spread between the largest and the smallest district of under five percentage points. So it still is well within acceptable uh, tolerances if you were to pursue just this this option here. But, but this option, this policy of attempting to not split municipal uh, boundaries by county commission district boundaries could be included in the other three redistricting uh, proposals that you have concerning single member districts. So, um, hey, Kurt. Kurt, yes, sir. let's assume you, that you had those two administrative changes and then this, this one here. Have you run that, those three, you said you could probably do all three of them. It wouldn't, uh, have you run those to get your deviations and see if we're okay? If we did? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have. Um, the, the, the housekeeping changes relating to census blocks changes, um, Sometimes in, in some of the plans, because of the changes in the, the district boundaries of that plan itself, the necessity, the block gets moved well with inside a, a district boundary. So it becomes, it's a moot issue, okay. right? The, the, the block that we showed you um, up here, this block here, if you were to move you know, this, the boundary here between District 4 and 5 to Enterprise Road or Sunset or some other place, this little issue up here becomes moot because it becomes embedded well with inside District 4. Right. But, so, but yes, we did include, in terms of the block changes, we did include all of those changes. There were six blocks, not a, there's probably, as an example, 20,000 blocks in in Pinellas County. But all of those sort of housekeeping technical changes were Im embedded in all of the other proposals that we have. What is not embedded in the other three single member district uh, plans, but could be, should you want it to, is uh, the policy of not splitting municipal boundaries. We could it, this could be included in all of the other single member plans or just one, you know, which, whichever one you decide that you want to uh, go with. Okay. Okay. So uh, if I might, I could go to uh, those plans uh, now, the remaining single member district plans. The first one is entitled uh, single member districts alternative one. And uh, this plan moves Clearwater Beach, which is part of the city of Clearwater, from District 4 into District 5 and to offset uh, some of the uh, gain in population into District 5, uh, the the boundary between District 4 and 5 in this uh, northern area of, of District 5 here is moved south to Enterprise Road. This uh, plan has a spread between the largest and the smallest district of three percentage points. And so this is well within acceptable tolerances should you want to pursue this change. This, this map makes, at the present time, no other changes to any of the other district boundaries uh, 
But as I said earlier, if you wanted to include the changes so as to not split some of the cities, uh, you could include that in this plan uh, as a matter of policy. So that's the, the first of the policy changes uh, for single member uh, districts. The next change for single member districts is called uh, RB Proposal 2. You, I believe, have seen this once before. Uh, it's very similar to the, the one that we just looked at. It moves Clearwater Beach into uh, District 5, but uh, moves part of District 4 south of Sunset Point Road uh, from District 4 into District 5 and to offset the uh, resulting change in population, it continues that line uh, in a easterly manner along uh, Sunset Point uh, until you, you end right here, which I believe is McMullen Booth Road. Okay. Um, so this and this plan um, is also well within acceptable uh, tolerances. You know, let me see if I can find this here. I think it's 3.1, I think you said. 3.1, thank you, yes, sir, right, 3.1. <clears throat> then the uh, final uh, plan for uh, changing single member district boundaries is Alternative 1B, uh, again, begins by moving uh, Clearwater Beach into District 5, uh, but then uh, continues with uh, an existing boundary here until we get to Sunset Point uh, Road, and then it moves that area north of Sunset Point that's currently in District 5 into District 4. Okay. Yeah, and, and the only oh. and and Kurt, just real quickly, the only reason I had asked for that one was just on the standard deviation. When you and I were talking about it, it seemed to be closer to two than the three, and that was. I just wanted to see how that would how that might make it a little bit closer in terms of the population loss and gain between the two. Although you know, clearly the one that the the board recommended is the the simplest one. And as well within the deviations that you were talking about, it's it, the one they did. It was it's just really straight across Sunset Point, um, and it's certainly a, a simpler approach to it. But I, I just really wanted to see what that would do to the deviations if you just kept that little jut in there. So, right, the spread is uh, two point one yeah. points. Yeah, not not really a big difference from the three, uh, but I just. Thought we'd check on it while we were doing it. So. Right, uh, you're you're operating in, uh, you know, we're uh, tweaking the the fine edges of of this plan. You're you're uh, fortunate that uh, uh, you know the, there's not drastic changes in in one area of the county in terms of population growth that would necessitate moving, doing some major changes to. Uh, district boundary lines to equalize population. That's not the case at all. Uh, the you, you grew by about five percent um, since 2010, and most of that growth seems to be relatively evenly distributed throughout the county. And so, uh, therefore, um, other than those technical changes, you really don't have to do anything else, but certainly if you wanted to, uh, you, you can. So those are the, the, the three sort of policy options in terms of single member districts. There is one other uh, policy option in terms of that large districts. Um, 
And uh, the, the redistricting board made uh, no uh, recommendations uh, in term, other than the housekeeping changes to the at-large residence uh, areas. Uh, but there is one change now that uh, Commissioner Justice had asked, and, and basically it, it, this moves um, the lines between three and one so that uh, Western St. Pete and all of St. Pete, Saint, the city of St. Petersburg, is included in District uh, 3. And that's, that's that recommendation in front of you here. This uh, plan has a, a spread between the largest and the smallest districts of, of 3.0 percentage points. So again, well within acceptable uh, tolerances. Versus. So I'll be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. It's, it's uh, I think, a pretty straightforward uh, process. It was, uh, you know, a little bit of a time crunch here, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there, you know, drastic changes to district boundaries were not uh, uh, necessary because of change the way population grew in Pinellas County over the past 10 years. Okay, well, <clears throat> Kurt, thank you, and uh, obviously a, a big thank you to our redistricting committee, uh, commission or committee, and uh, and the work that they did in a compressed time frame. Um, not that I'm not sure that additional time, you know, in this case would have made that much difference for them, but it, it would have provided a little more, you know, a little more lax approach, not lax, that's the wrong word, uh, just a, a more comfortable approach to the process for them, but um, they really appreciate how they came together on it. So <clears throat> open it up to the commission for any thoughts or ideas. Uh, I guess we could take a look at the two administrative changes and see if we're okay with that. And we could look at that policy of the city uh, and then look at this one here uh, that, that Commissioner Justice talked about. And then obviously um, the, uh, the ones between four and five. Commissioner Peters. Yes, thank you. Um Turn, yeah, it's not on. All right. I think the proposal that uh, Commissioner Justice proposed is, is a good one. Um, I also think that we should do the housekeeping um, that was recommended because um, it's minor and it makes sense to put each city in each city, you know, combined so that it's not split. Um, I would say my preference on all the maps, though, I would say whatever map we pick, we keep the housekeeping done. Right, and, and I do think Charlie's makes great sense. Um, um, and then it's just a matter of deciding on, I think, that map of, of four and five. Um, I do like the compactness of the alternative two, which I think was proposed before. By the group, yeah. By the, by the group, and so uh, you'll know, although it says alternative, I, I thought it was one of the original proposals. Um, I like the compactness of it. Um, that's really kind of the guidelines to do anyways, is to keep it compact. So that would be my recommendation, but definitely uh, Commissioner um, Justice's recommendation, definitely the housekeeping. Um, and, I, and I think the compactness on, on what is listed as alternative two um, is an ideal map. And, and the third one that he mentioned, Commissioner Peters, was the keeping the cities within the boundary. Yeah, so all the housekeeping. Well, I, he, he didn't. Uh, did you consider that one also housekeeping, the third one? Well, it, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, on the, it's on the borderline between okay. housekeeping and a minor policy okay. change, right? Uh, that's it's, fine. That's yeah. fine. Uh, and that's what you meant, though. Yes. The, you inclu included the third one in the housekeeping. Yes. Okay. It, yeah, Commissioner Long, uh, I'll get to you. Commissioner uh, Seal next. Go ahead. Yeah, you go next. I'm sorry, after you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with everything that Commissioner Peters just said because I think it makes the most sense and it's uh, as uncomplicated as I think we can talk about this issue. Yeah. Which number, I'm sorry, which? Alternative? Proposal number two and proposal number four. Single member district alternative two? 
which goes straight across, right, Sunset Point? Yes, the compactness, as Commissioner Peters made reference to. And Sunset Point Road is the, the yeah. new boundary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm on the right map. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just to be correct, the one that Commissioner Justice suggested is alternative, let me get that out, alternative three, at large alternative three. Yeah, yeah. That would be more of the policy, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I just wanted to find that one little switch up there. Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, thank you. I ended up having com my computer died, so I apologize. I had to get on another computer. So um, anyway, I would respectfully ask that you consider the map that I suggested um, you know, you are moving into District 5, Clearwater Beach, which wasn't there previously. So there are citizens that are definitely being impacted by the changes proposed in the map. Um, I have heard from some people in the countryside area, and of course they would like to remain in District 5. Um, you know, it's one reason why I propose taking it to Enterprise, because at least it left part of Clearwater <laughs> in um, District 5. So I would respectfully ask that you all consider Map 4, which was the one that I proposed that still meets the standard deviation, as um, Mr. Spitzer mentioned. I'm certainly comfortable with the rest of the housekeeping changes and um, would, uh, again, respectfully ask that you consider Map 4. It's still, it's, it, if you look at District 5, there's nothing compact about it. <laughs> you go down into Indian Shores, you know, the lines wander here and there and everywhere. Um, so I still think that this makes sense. And, and, and uh, Kurt, that's alternative one, right? It is. Correct. Um, it is. Okay. All right. Just alternative to... one, app four. <laughs> yeah. That's correct, right. Yeah. In the in the in the memo, I I I numbered the the plans or maps oh, just yeah. sort of yeah. sequentially, and so that's that's what map four is. Yeah, uh, I, I, ju I just saw the little the little map four. I had to pull out my magnifying glass to see the map four, but yeah, I got that. I, I was looking for map four <laughs> on there, but it's alternative one at the top. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and it, you know, it doesn't impact a lot of citizens that are already in District 5 by, you know, just moving it to Enterprise. But, you know, you are impacting the folks on Clearwater Beach um, by moving them in. But, you know, that's that's fine with me. I get the rationale behind it. Um, I'm just trying not to impact a lot more citizens. Any, uh, yeah, oh, Commissioner Gerard, sorry. Well, I just wanted to agree with Commissioner Seal. I like map four, alternative one. I also like um, alternative three for the at-large. I think that makes sense. Was that, that was, uh, that the was the one you brought. Yeah. Commissioner Justice. Yep. Yeah. Who <laughs> Any Any other thoughts? I'm hearing kind of a, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, Really, any of those three alternatives between four and five, whether you go straight across or whether the one that I proposed or the one that Commissioner Seal, I think they all have merit. So I, I really would be fine with the, the, the alternative one or map four. I'd be fine with that. And then all the others we kind of seem to be agreeing on. Um, just want to make sure I'm, I'm seeing that from everybody. Um, yes, I guess so. Um, so. You, you, Sorry about that. Um, you know, because it, it goes on Sunset Point Road, so it's a natural boundary. And by jutting back up again, you're taking away kind of that natural boundary. Um, and, you know, when you look at districts, I, my experience, most people have no idea what district they're in. Absolutely no idea what district they're in. Um, and so I really just don't know that that makes a big difference. Um, and I like the compactness of it, and that's part of the, the priorities, part of the yeah, standards. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and again, um, I think the deviations on 
on that one. They're so close. I know we're not talking, uh, Commissioner Seals not really talking deviations, although they're both fine. She's talking more about, you know, uh, some of the reactions or maybe some folks that have reached out to her. Um, I, you know, if I had to pick, I'd pick the one straight across. I'm, I'm somewhat flexible, but um, I might, and I'm guessing that really that, that's the two that we're looking at, really. That's the only issue that we kind of have to resolve ourselves around um, because the rest of it we seem to be on board with, right? Okay. Um, so, um, well, we're not making any decisions today. Um, we'll do that on, on Tuesday. And, you know, again, you know, if, if for anybody, and I'm not expecting at 1.30 in the afternoon that people are, are watching, but if, if they are and they, and they want to uh, reach out on that District 4-5 um, change and Enterprise Road versus Sunset Point, um, you know, certainly uh, would love to hear from you. Um, yes, Commissioner Justice. Just so I'm, I'm want to make sure, uh, the consensus is alternative two and alternative one, those are the top, the two we're looking at. Or are we also looking at alternative one B? No, I that one B I just I asked for just to just to check the the deviation on it. But I, I think it, from my perspective, going straight across makes the most sense. Um, and I just said what Commissioner Seal asked for, I'd be willing to consider. But um, I still kind of lean towards the straight across Sunset Point and not, not considering 1B. All right, uh, so one and two on the single, and then there was consensus on the at-large alternative three. Yes. With housekeeping. With, and house, the, and the with housekeeping, housekeeping on- the three housekeeping. Housekeeping on all of them. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and so Kurt, um, if you ran um, those changes that we just said, and you'd have two scenarios, one with the Enterprise Road and one with the Sunset Point, but ran all of the numbers, um, and you could get the deviations and make sure that we're, you, you, you feel comfortable that we're, we're fine. I'm comfortable that you're fine, but if, if this is the uh, direction that you'd like to go, I can uh, incorporate the, the housekeeping changes and meaning the, the changes due to census block ch boundary changes and also the changes uh, so that we don't split cities. I could incorporate those changes into uh, alternative one and two, that would be uh, a map uh, four and five. And then I can also incorporate the, well, the housekeeping changes in terms of census blocks are already incorporated into the at-large uh, alternative three. Uh, but I, we can rerun those and make sure everything's still within acceptable yeah. tolerances prior to next week. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, so alternative one and two, you're gonna, those are the two that we just talked about that uh, Commissioner Seal was mentioning and then the other one Commissioner Peters mentioned. You can incorporate, do a run with all the other changes, the other three changes and make sure that we're okay. And then, yes. yeah, and then obviously on the single member district, or no, excuse me, the at large district, you can check those as well. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I'm not a, seeing a, you know, a big change either, but you know, we can confirm that. And uh, I think either one on, on one or two alternative would, would probably meet the, the numbers that we need. But we will look at those, basically those two scenarios um, as our point of discussion after we hear from our public that may be calling in or weighing in on this. Yes, Commissioner Jar. Something about Hit that, hit there. Yeah. Okay, I, well, I think we settled that. I just wanted to bring something up yeah. about redistricting. I got a call yesterday about um, the maps for the congressional districts that are being put out, and I know there's a number of them. Um, but one is of particular concern um, that starts moving um, the Hillsborough district, I think that's 14, over into Pinellas again, and then moving uh, 12 farther north, and it really splits our county up again. I mean, right now we have one solid <laughs> yeah, person, you know, that represents Pinellas County. Uh, 
who's dedicated to Pinellas County and or one one district and I'm hoping that we could I mean obviously one that we've talked about boundary issues being important and I'd like us to write a letter to whoever is doing the redistricting there's a committee I guess and just ask them to respect county boundaries as much as possible because you know, I don't want to be 40% of somebody's district that is really over in Tampa and 20% of somebody who's really in Pasco that really dilutes our um, ability to do things in Congress. Uh, so, uh, 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 yeah, and I, I understand what you're, I haven't looked at them I mean, I don't think we yet. have to get yeah. real specific about it. I'm just saying, could they please just take a look at respecting our boundaries and, you know, well, I mean, we've had, I think, on the, on the uh, you're talking about the House, Senate, the Senate side? No, House. I'm sorry? Congressional district. Oh, congr I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I, I, again, I would have, I need to look at, but I, I understand your comment about respecting boundaries. I don't, you know, we don't have that in the state either. I mean, the state has, you well, know, I, know. I think it, it, McMullen Booth splits two House seats, um, right. you know, east and west, and which is predominantly a Hillsboro. I mean, it, it, you know, you don't do it much. I don't know how far over does it come. I don't know. I just know the one, the one proposal, splits that Hillsborough district and brings it over here forty percent, which obviously lessens our district. I'm not sure which way, yeah. whether it goes south or north or what. But like, it's, you know, states. it just chops us up again. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Did We've you been have... there before. Oh. I, just, I think those are very early, and Brian could probably educate us better. Those are very early proposals in the process in Tallahassee. Um, I think some of them are kind of shots across the bow politically. Um, well, exactly. But. And um, and they didn't pass legal muster last time when they tried to do that as far as crossing the bridge. So, right. But right. we should definitely keep an eye on it and communicate with the legislators. <laughs> yes. Mr. Peters. Please, Brian, do that. Well, and my thought is the same. Um, this is way too early, but they have such stringent laws that they have to adhere to, and they cannot just protect one county. They cannot. The law will not allow them to. You can recommend all you want, but they've been tight-lipped and not even con having conversations about redistricting with anybody um, uh, for fear of getting a lawsuit. And so I, I just think it's too soon. I do. I think Brian watches it and keeps us up to date. But there's there's so many laws yeah. that they have to adhere to and procedures that, um, and it's going to go to court anyways. It doesn't matter. Somebody's going to file a lawsuit yeah. and they'll take it to court anyways. So I, I wouldn't worry about it so much. And if I had three Congress people in this county, I think that's better than two. So I don't have a problem with that either. Yeah. Uh, Jewel, did you have a comment? Yeah, one thing I'll add just as context for um, this conversation, but also your own maps. Um, you know, Kurt, our consultant, has very accurately stated that the um, the legal standard that's largely recognized by courts for those deviations for your maps uh, is recognized, 10% is recognized as acceptable. The congressional districts have a very different standard and they're allowed, the folks drawing the maps are allowed very little latitude at all. And what courts are really looking for with the congressional maps is even population among all the districts. They don't get that 10%. Uh, standard that we do on these on our maps and even like the state maps. So just for context, I mean that does constrain them, you know, some a little yeah. bit more than than uh, than your constraint. Just for your information, um, and the only other thing I would add to the conversation is just for your benefit and for any of the public that might be watching. Um, this is not scheduled as a public hearing at your meeting on Tuesday because that is not what is required by law. So it's not included with your public hearings, your zoning cases, your ordinances, et cetera. This is on your regular agenda. And of course, everybody who wants to have an opportunity to speak to you all and provide public comment will be able to. Really subsequent to a change in statute that the legislature made several years back that gives citizens the right to be able to address you on any item that you're going to take action on. Since that change in the statutes, the public comment on all of your, there's really not a lot of distinction on the, the right that a citizen has to comment between your public hearing items and your regular agenda items. The big difference is on your quasi-judicial, of course, but on the legal notice that is required. Now, strangely, 
your legal notice that is very strictly required by statutes on these redistricting maps is after the fact. So after you adopt the maps, they'll be published in the newspapers and um, we'll go through all of those, you know, statutory requirements. So just so you all are aware, one of the other things that I'll be asking you to do on Tuesday is to direct the clerk to make those advertisements happen. Um, but just to get kind of clear the process here, it's not a public hearing, it's not required by law. The public, of course, is invited to and able to comment on the maps that you're looking at and the proposals as you go through this, but just wanted to put that out there in case there was any question. Okay, so the, the, the big takeaway there is that folks who may be watching, we will not be addressing this issue after six o'clock, which is where our public hearings are. It will be, I, I'm not gonna guess the time, but you know. It's the three. It's agenda item number 41. Yeah, so towards the end of the afternoon session, probably be about 5, 4.30, who knows? And, and yeah. I have, just for the benefit of you all, talked with your communications staff about putting out a press release to make sure that we're getting the word out um, as much as possible in advance of your meeting on Tuesday. Yeah, I'd make sure we get that out, like, pronto. Uh, did you have something, Barry, on that? Anything else before we move on? Okay. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry Commissioner Seal. Go ahead. Um, so, so that it's clear, because I think people want to weigh in on 41, will they be allowed to speak under agenda item 41, or will they, should they come under citizens to be heard? No, we'll take it under uh, 41. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for the clarity. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let's move on to item five. Jewel. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, sir. Um, under item five, this is in follow-up to a discussion that you all previously had. Um, I emailed to each of you a list of, I would call high-level policy considerations that you would want to take a look at as far as um, continuing any conversation you all would like to have regarding potentially putting before the voters next year the issue of term limits that would be an amendment to your charter. And so what you have are two, there's um, a breakdown of what I emailed to you all of the policy considerations of what a, what a term limit um, provision might look like and I also included a couple of matters that I think are of note regarding the procedure required which is essentially, if you were to move forward, you would do so by ordinance, which would require a supermajority vote of the commission. So five out of the seven of you would need to vote uh, in favor. And then of course, this would appear on the ballot in November. Um, yeah, and just for clarification, the five would be to pass the ordinance that would then start putting the stuff together for the referendum. That's not correct. From, not from us here to put it on the commission for discussion. Correct. Okay. The we, ordinance would have to be adopted by a supermajority. Yeah. And just again, I know I've mentioned this in the past, uh, state constitutional amendments require a 60% threshold. Your charter does not. <clears throat> it is a 50% threshold. So 50% of the electorate plus one would need, well, 50% of those voting in the election plus one would need to vote in favor. Okay, thank you. Well, and, <clears throat> and I, I put this term limit proposal together. Um, I'm sorry that we, I, I don't think people got it until yesterday. Uh, not that it's that complicated, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody got it ahead of time. Uh, and clearly um, the idea is basically th three, three terms um, and then sitting out for, for four years at least before you come back in either this, the seat you were in or your companion seat. Um, and. And then, and then, and then addressing the transition, um, I just we obviously would have to put it in a policy verbiage, but I just wanted it to be clear what my intention was uh, through this, and um, so I just th that's why the uh, third bullet point, the second and third paragraph, were just more to just be very specific how I saw that translating, and I wanted to make sure Jewel saw it the same way, and she and she did, but. So for conversation purposes, it just it becomes a three terms, four years away before you run again. And, um, and, then it, and it provides for everybody here that's serving 
to have a minimum of three terms. There's some that would end up with a fourth term, and, and that's, but it's just the way it works out for those people. We have different people. We have people in their first term uh, finishing or halfway through a first term and somebody finishing a first term, and then we got um, Commissioner Gerard and I finishing a second term, and, and then, you know, so we have different groups here. So, um, again, uh, my hope was that we ha would have a discussion about um, the idea of of, a, of three terms. Uh, if, if, the, if the preference is to do two terms, that's fine. If the preference is not to do term limits, I, I, I certainly respect that. But I was thinking more about, you know, giving an option that we think makes sense for us here um, uh, so that we can let the residents make a choice. Um, because I, I made a comment to somebody, you know, they asked about, you know, you know, they were thankful that we were at least having the discussion. And I said, well, you know, it doesn't, you know, because they were saying they believed in eight, eight years. And I said, well, there's nothing that, she said, oh, how do you know we're not working on that now? And I said, I don't. Um, so it could be that somebody's out there working on, uh, you know, eight years. But uh, for me, th I, this made sense to me because um, I've often said I'm not sure at the county commission whether it should be eight years or 12 years. Um, I think differently than some of the, the folks up in Tallahassee. I think those should be 12 years as well. But you have different thoughts of the, uh, on that as well. But I think giving people more time to do their job here and, um, is, is a good thing. But at, at, at the same time, having some reasonable limits on it. And again, at the end of the day, whether you agree with it or not, it's the residents making a decision. So Commissioner Peters. So I would support it, but I would I would consider one change. I think the sitting out for four years is a little long. I think sitting out for two would be sufficient. Um, but I, I would have no problem with this. Yeah, some of the some of the companion seats t tend to be four years or two years. So you know if you wanted to switch to, to your companion seat. So yeah, but you still have to sit out for two years. So you, yeah. you know, I don't, yeah. I don't know that four years, um, I think that's excessive, but I think two years is sufficient. And, um, and, I, and I like the idea of letting the voters make this decision. I really strongly support that. So, uh, you know, I have no problem moving this forward. Thank you. Anybody else? Just a question. Yeah. What's, uh, what's our timeline as far as if for November ballot, language, supervisor, all that kind of stuff, what would what would you need language time off the top of my head i would suggest a few months um those of you all that have sat on canvassing and are familiar with the process know that the initial ballots go out around 45 days to your overseas voters in advance of the election i i would think that probably six months in advance might be reasonable to at least start your process as far as we need to advertise the ordinance, you need to have the public hearing, we need to get the language to the supervisor and make sure that we get through all the hurdles. Um, I would suggest probably six months. The, you know, if you're gonna have an election in November, I would think that you would need to take this up, you know, maybe late winter, early spring, to make sure that we have enough time to, you know, get an ordinance drafted, get it properly advertised, have your public hearing and, and all those things. So sometime May May time frame, generally. Yeah, yeah I, I would think if you could have your public hearing in May so that we have the language, we have it available, we can get it to the supervisor because I know that they're typically um, looking at the language for their ballots, you know, maybe like 60 to 90 days in advance of the election. And of course they're gonna have you know, primary and other things going on. So the sooner we can get it to them, the better. But I would think you wouldn't, I, I, I would recommend that if you were going to move forward to not have a public hearing on the ordinance any later than May. And of course, we'd wanna draft the ordinance and maybe give you all a look at it before you take it to the public hearing. So kind of keep that in mind as far as building a potential timeline. Okay, thank you. All right, any other other thoughts about um, moving it to, I, I guess, it, you know, if you're talking a, the public hearing part, which would be at commission meeting, is it, you said one or two? One, one here. Um, then the work that we still, ha that we have left to do is um, just seeing if there's any interest in moving it to that, that time frame or, 
having another workshop to discuss it again. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying I'm not trying to beat this to death, but I think, you know, at some point I just try to make sure I know between now what we're talking about and what Commissioner Justice was saying, the, the steps that need to happen. And, and if you all are interested, I can certainly get in touch with the supervisor's office and then, you know, kind of double check your legal requirements and create a timeline. Um, you've heard me say it before, kind of our, our old habit or maybe current habit of coming to the board with ordinances and requesting authority to advertise, not a legally required step, but maybe something you might want to undertake if you were going to move this particular ordinance forward because it would give everybody an opportunity uh, to see the ordinance before it was advertised for public hearing and give you all an opportunity to talk again. Alternatively, you could put it out of work session. But I would suggest if you were going to continue the conversation that we have an actual ordinance to take a look at. Either either at a meeting or at a workshop. Or, right. Either yeah. one would work. Of course, you know, it goes without saying the ordinance would be at a public hearing. Okay. okay. Um, any other comments, thoughts? Um, I guess by no, no comments, everybody's excited about moving it forward. Um, that's the way I'm reading it because I'm not getting I'm not getting negatives. So I'm not trying to be funny about it, but you know I asked that we have a dis okay. That's that's I'm looking for some kind of you know feedback. No, it's not inappropriate because I'm trying to get some feedback and I'm not getting any. So thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I was. Yeah. No, I'm not, I, I wasn't going there either. Sorry about that. Any, any, yes, Commissioner Gerard. I think the silence is a uh, reiteration of what you got the last time you brought this up. That's your response. Okay. So I'm, I'm hearing no interest then from the, the silence. Is that what I'm? That's what you okay. Hear. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we won't be moving that forward then because I think with two people moving it forward, it's, uh, not going to happen. So uh, I'm sorry that you all feel that way. I think you're missing the boat on an opportunity and it's going to come your way anyway. So, all right, let's go on to um, the next item, which is our agenda briefing. All right. Um, just jumping over all the different um, receipt for files um, and reports, unless there's questions regarding any of those, we can move to item 22. Any questions before that. Item number 22 is an award of bid to FPG Florida. Uh, this is for indigent and unclaimed burial and cremation services. Uh, total five-year contract expenditures of uh, $2.4 million. Item number 23 uh, is an award of bid to American Empire Builders for Oakwood Drive Bridge Replacement Project, $3.3 million. Item number 24 is award of bid to TLC Diversified. This is for the construction of the Keller uh, Regional Trace uh, Treatment um, Phosphate building, pro and building and Process, uh, process Upgrades. And some of the things that they're going to be doing as part of that project are listed within your packet. Um, $1.7 million. Under item number 25, this is your monthly report of cases filed against the county. Um, the one case on your report, I'm pleased to say, is not a trip and fall on a sidewalk. It's a quiet title action. Item number 26 is a countywide uh, map amendment. It's your annual update. Uh, item number 27 is purchase authorization for requirements for heavy and light duty vehicles from a variety of different um, competitively sourced um, um, places, and this is uh, uh, includes a purchase of six uh, fully electric vehicles and 24 electric golf carts, kind of beginning that program, um, but doing it in a phased manner. But again, this is our annual purchase of all of our vehicles, uh, $5.6 million. 28th, ranking of firms um, and agreements with a AFCON for professional engineering design services for the new Airco taxiways, uh, $1.5 million. 
and, and companion. Um, this is a ranking of firms, Michael Baker International for professional engineering services. This is for cargo apron reconstruction and replacement of runway uh, 9.9-27, $1.8 million. Item 30 is an agreement with Cost Media Services. This is international sales and public relations representatives uh, for Central uh, Europe. This is uh, $320,000 annually, uh, 60 months uh, contract for $1.5 million. Item 31 is a contract for Roster Creative L LTD. This is uh, for same thing, uh, international sales and public relations. This is for UK. Ireland and Scandinavia, uh, 366,000 annually for $1.8 million. I, Mr. Chairman, I assume yeah. that the chairman next year will need to travel there to make sure that they're doing the work we're requiring them to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, 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 that's a change. Two years of not traveling and he's gonna be traveling like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, I understand. The contract's actually, you know, for, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, local arts agency funding with Creative Pinellas, uh, $976,000, uh, $78,000. Um, this is a total of um, 145, or tourism development tax, 145000 from the general fund and 36000 from the transportation trust fund. Item number 33, um, this is an additional uh, budget uh, resolution increase for the clerk of court's budget. Uh, they actually brought in a, a, a significant amount of money um, this past year. They've asked for a little bit of that to offset some of the cost uh, that they're incurring. One of those big ones is part of the Oracle upgrade, and you're well aware of the Oracle upgrades we're currently doing. Well, they, we budgeted about $145,000 for modifications within their office as part of that contract. When they actually got in and scoping it, it was about $750,000. Again, these are things that are process improvements to make their, op, uh, their office and all of our financials operate more efficiently, so these are pain points within our system. It makes a lot of sense and so we, we do recommend that. What they also requested as part of that is to be able to implement Equestica, which is our budget, but they want to have their own license to be able to manage all their different funds. And I met with Ken and his staff and they talked about the difficulties they have with uh, not having their own budget license to be able to properly budget against all their account codes and classes, even over into with the court funds and things like that. That is about 150000 the final piece is they, they have a real space issue and they want to build out some space for housing staff over at the Swisher building. Um, again, it, it's going to take us time before we address all of the space needs um, and so they've requested funding to be able to do that. And so those are the three components of that request. Item number 34 is a hazard mitigation, mitigation grant with Florida Department of Environmental um, Management. This is for the replacement of hard hardening of uh, span wire traffic signals with masked arms traffic signals. Requested grant is $4.3 million. Um, it, that would be, or project cost is 5.8, 4.3 um, from the state, 25% local match if we're successful in receiving it. Item number 35 is a resolution to provide authority for use of golf carts within the unincorporated Bardmore uh, North community. They've made that request. They meet, they've met with them. They meet all the statutory issues. Item 36, a renewal certificate of public convenience and necessity for advanced life support um, providers. All of the various ones are listed within your packet. Item 37 is a resolution amending the county's investment policy, uh, um, amend the investment policy for changes recommended by the investment committee. committee. These are minor changes uh, and again, outlined within your packet. Did I, did I have a foo paw? Um, <laughs> I, I probably have more than one. Um, 38 is a reappointment to the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board. Uh, this is a reappointment.
Under item number 39, uh, this is a matter that is related to um, some potential additional litigation related to the opioid epidemic. Uh, I will bring your attention to the fact that what you'll see under the recommendation is not a strong recommendation uh, from your county attorney staff. It basically says that you consider filing this suit rather than we recommend you file this suit. Uh, this has been brought to our attention by the outside counsel that has been engaged all along uh, in the various lawsuits that the county has taken part in. Um, I would encourage any of you that might wish to speak with me about our reservations to let me know and I will contact you prior to Tuesday's meeting. I feel that uh, speaking about these issues are better done offline. Um, so moving on to item number 40. This is a resolution that we're asking the board to adopt to set forth uh, our qualification in and different uh, lawsuits related to the opioid epidemic. But this resolution is to establish Pinellas County as a qualified county, which is one of the requirements under the settlement that is moving forward um, under the umbrella of the Attorney General. The resolution here uh, satisfies two requirements by outlining uh, the county's membership in the Pinellas County Opioid Task Force and our adoption of the Opioid Task Force Strategic Plan. So we're just simply asking that that be done by resolution to make it abundantly clear that we are a qualified county entitled to receive the funds um, in a settlement agreement that you all have already looked at and taken action with uh, with the Attorney General. And again, this is a, a, a step to get us uh, considered as a qualified county. And then under county attorney reports, we've already talked about redistricting. And under the virtual meeting, I have included there the policy that you all have discussed um, a time or two, I believe, at uh, board workshops. So we have hopefully reduced to writing the um, intent and the wishes of all of you as far as a, a formal policy, which really reflects what you have done already through the years. Uh, so anyway, that's on the agenda for you all to approve or discuss further or perhaps not approve, but anyway, it's there for, for you all to consider doing with it as you wish. I will have a county administrator's report item 42. Item 43 is approval of our 2022 state legislative program. Uh, the items are um, included below. That's the support of the special act for non-voluntary uh, non annexation of the East Tarpon Lake uh, community. Support for the continued use of the rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Support for um, legislation that allows local governments to create local solutions uh, for our private sanitary sewer laterals, as we've discussed. Um, support for the, um, for the Florida Waste to Energy Coalition um, that um, for communities that are governments that own waste energy facilities. Um, a request for funding for High Point Community Park as a partnership between Pinellas County and the Pinellas County School Districts for recreation services for students in the High Point Elementary and in the High Point community. And finally, a request for state support for county efforts to secure federal funding for the construction of the Dunedin Causeway. Item 44 is appointments and reappointments so, to the- Hold on one second, oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Long. Yeah, Mayor, I wanted to ask you, um, the guiding principle included to support innovative funding strategies to address the declining revenue source of transportation funding. What what are you thinking there? Well, I think that there's items that come up during the legislative session, so we wanted to have guiding principles that allow us to act based upon proposals that'll come up. Um, it's, it's not what we know, it's the ones that we don't know and that we are gonna have to respond to. I think that's, it's more of a guiding principle that gives us direction to act on your behalf. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 44 is appointment, three appointments to the Feather Sound Community Services District. Commissioners Long, Gerard, oh, everyone. Item 45 is appointments, three appointments to the Historic Preservation Board. Item 46 is appointments to the Lumman Community uh, Redevelopment Area Advisory Committee. 
Item 47 are reappointments to the Palm Harbor Community Services Agency. Next is reappointment to the Unified Personnel Board. Next is appointments to the Value Adjustment Board. And then County Commissioner New Business. Under public hearings, moving to item 51. Um, the first item is um, a case out of uh, City of St. Petersburg. This is uh, an activity to activity center. This is for 17.91 acres um, in the Gandhi Boulevard. This is in the whole Tri-County area. Uh, th this is a category, to re it's gonna remain the same, but what they're proposing is changing from industrial limited to a planned development. This change uh, will be uh, presented as a tier two amendment. Uh, this will, uh, the intent of the developers to build approximately 410 units of, for multifamily residential housing and approximately 500,000 square feet of industrial uh, for this area. The city has entered into a development agreement with the city and it does include 20% uh, multifamily residential be designated as workforce housing. Item 52 is a map amendment from City of Pinellas Park uh, from a targeted employment center to retail services on 5.25 acres. Um, this is at the southeast corner of Almerton and 49th Street. Uh, this is uh, the, the, there's a certain part of the area that remains the same, but two existing ho two hotels are proposed to be converted into 183 residential multifamily units with eight of these designated as affordable housing. Item 53 is a petition um, for vacation of a 50-foot right-of-way um, on Palmetto Avenue. Uh, the staff recommendation is denial of the petition to vacate. Uh, this, uh, the county staff's recommendation is denial because the right-of-way and the alley provide the ability to improve storm water uh, drainage in the area. Um, and also it provides for future connectivity to Church Street and potential transportation improvements. That we also are looking at this as a possible transfer for uh, from us to the city of safety harbor item 54 is a petition uh, for to vacate the south 260 feet of 18th street um, rec staff recommendation is to to uh, deny the petition to vacate um, uh, the requested vacation will allow the, just an increase to the property uh, size of the property. County staff's recommendation um, is that the, this would result in a super block exceeding the maximum 900 feet allowed per Pinellas County land code. Item 55 is a TEFRA hearing. This is $23 million uh, for um, healthcare facility refunding and revenue bonds. Um, again, this does, this, we need, by state law, we need to approve them for them. It's basically certifying that it's for a local use. It does not put the county at risk. Um, on Tuesday, I'd asked Chris, is going to, uh, I had a question earlier about why do we have to approve these? Chris wants to go back and just re review the state law and why we're involved in this process, even though it does, it doesn't put the county at risk. So as part of Tuesday's meeting, he'll give you a kind of a brief outline of why we're involved in this transaction. Good. Okay. Item 56 is uh, a moratorium related to the related to the expansion of commercial relocations in the retail sale of cats and dogs. And we've discussed this before. This is the moratorium. We put it in place for a year. We intend on bringing this back in the spring, but we wanna do all the research necessary to answer all the questions that have been raised. And, and if I can add one. Sorry, if I can add one thing on the moratorium ordinance, um, I am going to ask you all to make one minor revision to that ordinance. In reviewing this after we put it on the agenda, the language that you normally see in all of your ordinances that uh, provide for them to be included in your code, so the codification process, which is essentially what converts them from ordinance to muni code, didn't make it into this ordinance, so we're just going to ask you to make that one housekeeping change, not substantive in any way, shape, or form. I do have some copies I will hand out to you the night of the hearing. 
and I'll have additional available should anybody in the public want one. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I shared this conversation with um, Brian Lowack and with Barry, but um, should the state legislature pass um, one of the bills that's moving quickly, it passed two committees on the other day. I spoke with uh, Senator Darrell Roussan briefly about it um, regarding the ability for those businesses to sue the municipality or the county government if it can be shown that they were deprived of income or the ability to make a living. So if that passes, but we're passing our ordinance in advance, we just reel our ordinance back because we would have to then certainly follow what the new law is um, regarding these dog swords, or would we want to consider waiting to see what happens in the state legislature what? and I'm, save us some grief? I'd, I'd defer to Joel, but if we pass our um, that that ban before that bill passes, then it wouldn't impact us. Um, it would be grandfathered if that's... Unless they contain, unless the legislature passes that and includes very specific language making it retroactive in nature, we would be grandfathered, like the administrator has said. Um, and also keep in mind any impact would be temporary because the moratorium is only temporary. Okay. Now, if you do move forward with another ordinance, we would certainly, if that bill passes, we would certainly need to take that into consideration. So as you as you, as we bring that information forward, we'll have to track where that bill is and the potential impacts of that in your decision making. Anything? Anything else? Anything else by the commission, Commissioner Seal? Anything? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. We are adjourned. <laughs>